Are you bummed out by limp pizza slices that somehow seem to be made with some vile construction of Worcestershire sauce, marshmallows, and anchovies? Oh, what about those gas station bologna sandwiches that seem to have been marinated in Welch's grape jelly? Or worse yet, the chicken salad that seems to have had yellow food coloring added for nothing more than appearance. Can you not take one more breakfast consistent almost entirely of bananas? Or even worse yet, another New England ball dinner? Then you need to saddle up and ride over to Mama Sugarbacks and try some of our most popular dishes, all designed to fill you up for however many miles you have ahead of you. Like the seafood stew, loaded with garlic, cumin, oregano, and chilies, paired with our fresh catch of the day. Every plate is guaranteed to satisfy, from children to adults, from the hungriest of truckers to the deadliest of warriors. Even hippies, too. This ain't Elvis country. We serve everyone. And check this out. For Mapping the Zone listeners, all you need to do is walk up to the counter where Loretta's serving that hot coffee all day long and mention the key code ZOID. And we'll get you a hot shower and an even hotter meal and at a 10% discount. Mama Sugarbacks, right in for the real food. Not that disgusting substitution. Thank you for joining us in Mapping the Zone, a podcast dedicated to informal discussion of the works and context of Thomas Pynchon. My name is Kate, and I'm one of the co-hosts. My name is Cody. I'm Luke. And unfortunately, Will is not here. Uh, He's fallen underneath the weather. You know, I'm going to stop starting episodes by saying next week we'll have everybody together. (laughs) It's become our curse. Like, just for Vineland, for some reason. Yeah. Um, I think it's so funny that we went through all of Lot 49 and almost all of Mason and Dixon with no people being gone. And then just Vineland, for some reason, is just getting hit with it. Yep. But that being said, um, we are going to be discussing Chapter 12, which is not only one of the, the longest chapters in the book, but is also... One of the most significant, um, I would probably say that, if anything, it's it's kind of the linchpin by which this whole book operates. Um, so that being said, what were your guys' general thoughts on the chapters? I, I definitely agree with you that it is the uh, the linchpin of of everything here. I, I it's it's funny because I go back and I think about how at the beginning of the episodes on this book we talked about how um how warm it is and how it's not as as bleak as something as as gravity's rainbow but then i forget that this chapter exists and how absolutely heavy it gets at times and how dark it gets and it i think it really speaks a lot to uh to penchon's ability to balance that darkness with all of the other um warmth and, and light that's found throughout the book because it it is incredibly i think this is at this point might be my favorite chapter in the book it is a a very harrowing journey through uh learning ab- about frenesi and her past and learning more about brock and how awful he is and um you know going through everything with weed and it's there's so much um darkness that's in this chapter but it is also it might be i think my favorite as far as the writing itself the prose and and the way he puts together a lot of the uh the imagery that's in here and the descriptions of of the characters and what they're doing and it's it's beautiful and it's dark and it's it's an absolutely stunning chapter and i got to a point 
I, I had to split my reading between two days. And this morning when I was finishing up this chapter, I, I had to stop because I realized I wasn't taking notes. I was just <laughs> like so stuck in the story. I had to like backtrack. I think it was like four or five pages that I just blew through without putting, you know, taking any notes. So I had to go back and, and reread and, and put my notes down. But I think that's a testament to how well done this chapter is and how important it is in, in the story itself. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, Luke, what about you? It's this chapter, it, ha it does have some of my favorite parts of the book in it. Uh, I, I don't particularly like the beginning of the chapter. Um, to be perfectly honest, um, I found the beginning kind of random. Um, I enjoyed, the, I mean, there's stuff I liked about the Thanatoid party, but it's just not a super exciting or like, um, interesting part to me. Um, I didn't necessarily understand all the digressions or why the digressions about the, um, Dentists were in there. I mean, I get that Weed encounters him at the Thanatoid party, but um, it's kind of scanned as random to me. Um, that being said, once you get deeper into the chapter, it obviously gets more enjoyable. Um, we do kind of finally get the the, the conclusion of the DL Frenesi um, relationship, which is very important. Um, I really loved. The, we finally see DL in action as a ninjet. Um, yeah. Is, is, is really enjoyable. Um, probably some of the most enjoyable parts of this book so far, if not the most enjoyable. Um, yeah, I mean, there, like I said, I mean, there, it's just kind of up and down and, and all over the place and in some ways. I mean, like I said, there's stuff I really like, stuff I really don't like. Um, I do kind of, I mean, it is, it is pretty masterful the way that Pynchon transitions from the thanatoid party to the 60s and then it, and by the end of the chapter we go back to um the action being kind of narrated by dl um right kind of in the middle there we're just in we're just in the middle of a flashback but it, it transitions from band meter um and like stuff with the stuff at the beginning like with weed being sparked like sparking the narrator to go back in time and then we return to the present day, 1984, at the end, but um, with back with Prairie and DL, uh, which I, I did really like um, that that authorial maneuver. But like, I mean, if I was the editor for this book, to be perfectly honest, I would have told Pynchon that we need to we need to I would have I would have tried to cut the the beginning of the chapter a fair amount just because, um, especially the part about the dentist. I don't understand that it didn't seem to go anywhere. It doesn't really add much. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm kind of lukewarm on this chapter, I guess. Um, like I said, there's some really enjoyable parts, though. Yeah, I mean, so I think that this is probably... It's hard for me to say that just chapter 12 is, is the best, because it feels like, to me anyway, that 10, 11, and 12 are essentially one chapter if not almost a novella that exists within Vineland as a novel, because it's such a complete story of this whole thing that happened with the People's Republic of Rock and Roll and Frenesi and, you know, DL and, and how all of that sort of came unglued. And obviously by the end of it, we learn that in the aftermath of all that, that was where Frenesi was at when she met you know, Zoid, which of course takes us back to the beginning of the story. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, like, especially to Will's point about the length of it, I don't, I don't necessarily agree in that it needs to be edited down, but in thinking about this book being adapted to film, if P Paul Thomas Anderson is adapting it, I don't see how the material of this book could be done justice in a singular film. Like, with PTA saying in an interview a long time ago that he wanted to adapt Vineland but just couldn't figure out how to do it, I'm no longer surprised by that on a fresh reading of this book because this part of the story, as far as the People's Republic of Rock and Roll and everything that this chapter and the preceding two cover is enough for one two and a half hour long movie if you want to fully encapsulate and express that sort of story. So I do think that, like, it is incredibly long, and at times I think it can feel 
divergent, especially when you consider where the book started. But to me, it all rings as being necessary to the emotional and character beats that, that Pinchot is working towards, which, to Cody's point about the warmth, is just very different from the rest of his books. Like, this is all character-motivated drama. It's all being pushed by individual characters' actions and, and headspaces as opposed to necessarily sort of narrative tension and drama and event after event after event after event happening. I mean, essentially, chapters 10, 11, and 12 are five people sitting in a room watching old movies, home movies that were recorded, you know, decades prior. That's all this technically is. But within that time frame, Pinchon takes the reader on such an incredible journey through the characters' lives that were involved with why those films were made in the first place, which is so incredible. Um, as a final note on the dentist thing, Luke, um, the dentist is brought up and talked about because it is where Weed is sent by force by the FBI to begin his re-education. So the reason why the dentist is showing up and there's that sort of extended introduction for him is to, to get the backstory in place for why Weed had to be sent there over the course of like the dissolution of the, the, the PR3. Um, but I agree that at, at first glance it seems very long and meandering and, and not necessarily necessary. Um, at least that was my, my takeaway from reading this chapter. But I agree with both of you in that there is some incredibly proficient technical writing here from a standpoint of how he manages to make all these flashbacks flow together and the time skipping nature of it work. It's yeah. just it's such a hard act to balance for any writer, let alone someone, you know, of of Pinchon's caliber. Yeah. And I have to so I like your point about ten, eleven, and twelve being sort of a almost having a standalone feel I, I have to wonder now if maybe that was the the sort of origin or originating point for the story and he built everything out from there um, because it really is like those three chapters are really a pretty good distillation of everything that this book is about mm -hmm. um and yeah and i'm also i'm with you on the the dennis thing it took me a minute to clock that as well i was kind of with with luke on that uh while i was reading it at first but then as the chapter progressed i kind of you know, was able to figure out, okay, this, I see what they're doing, you know, why, why this is being set up, you know, because this is, this is how they're kind of programming him essentially or reprogramming him. Um, to, to loop back to your point on uh, an adaptation of this and, and the uh, difficulty in doing that. Um, I do want to bring up, there was uh, some kind of developments in the, in the adaptation possibilities um with with P.T. Anderson and his next film, and and I will say, Kate, I do I do agree that I think, especially after reading these last three chapters, um, I don't think you could do this as one film, even for someone like P.T.A. who is known <laughs> for long ass films. Um, I really, yeah, I don't think you could do it like that, and I don't think it would serve well to split it into two films. I think it kind of it, it circles back to that whole idea of it. it maybe being served better as like a TV miniseries. Mm. Um, either way, the the most recent update regarding PTA's next film is that it's a, it's a huge budget for one. I think it's the biggest budget he's ever got. It's like a hundred million. Um, and it's also a, it's said to be a contemporary setting, which I, as far as I, I, I can understand taking certain stories and, and adapting them to a, a different age and still having the ability to tell that story. I think this book is so um, kind of ingrained in the time that it is set. I don't think you can shift the time frame and have the same story be told. I think so mm -hmm. much of it hinges on, on specifically how all of these cultural and political and societal norms were changing and shifting in the sixties, excuse me, in the sixties and the eighties. I think to shift it to, even if they were to do it as the the twenty twenties and the the like the nineteen nineties, um, it's just not. There's there's too much that would have to be changed. It would become a, a like a real ship of Theseus kind of situation where mm -hmm. it's just not the same story anymore. Yeah, unless you're gonna make it about like an alternate universe, like Occupy movement, 
I really don't see how you can strike the same sort of resonant chord that yeah. would exist within the 60s and 70s counterculture and then the the complete obliteration of that that was completed in the 80s. Yeah, I just don't and then at that point, yeah, it's not it's not Vineland. It's it's something else about a, about a, a yeah. modern political struggle. Um, yeah, I think I also heard the, a, a rumor that it is supposed to be his most commercial film yet, which yeah is I don't not know how I feel about that. I, yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about that in general, but that also does not describe anything Pinchon no. um, to, no. to to any degree. Especially seeing how the re the reaction to his inherent vice adaptation I, I, in general, because I love that film. I thought it was a great adaptation. I know a lot of the PTA crowd does not like it. Um, and I know critically it didn't do great either. So yeah, to have it be a, a, a very highly commercial film doesn't, doesn't map onto this very well. No, no, it doesn't. It does make me incredibly curious what what he's doing yeah. what he's doing yeah um yeah i'm, I'm very curious to see what it's going to be um hopefully something good i was kind of licorice pizza i was kind of lukewarm on but i don't i don't i i came away from that movie at the end going okay what was the point of that like yeah yeah that's kind of where it, i was it's just, it's, that was a fun slice of life adventure you took us on i guess but i don't i don't get what i sat through two and a half hours of that for was yeah yeah i uh to go back to the vineland adap adaptation um which again i mean I, I think we've arrived at the fact that it's it's probably on it, it's most it's unlikely at this point that that's going to be paul thomas anderson's next movie i do think that there's a way that you could do this movie and in, in one i mean do this book as as one movie it's just a, it's just about the amount you'd have to cut mm -hmm. um you know, if you kind of if you skip over the Zoid parts at the beginning, or I don't, there's a, I think there's a way to do it. I've kind of in my brain thinking, been thinking in my brain like, you know, if, while I'm reading, I'll, I'll think, you know, would I would I keep this? Would I cut this from a movie ad adaptation? And I do think there's mm -hmm. a way to do it. Um, I think you'd have to mess with the timeline uh, of the movie um, in terms of what you're including and what and and what you're not including and in, in when stuff is happening in the book versus when stuff would be happening in the movie and stuff. Um, I do think there's a way to do it. Yeah. It's just a matter of how much you would have to cut. I mean, I don't want to, I don't, you know, it's pension. So there's always going to be a lot of tangents and digressions. Yeah. And subplots. Um, so it's just more of a question of, of what, what, what makes the final cut of the movie and what doesn't, I mean, inherent vice, the movie, uh, cuts out the whole Vegas, the whole part yeah. um, set in Vegas, and I don't think the movie really suffers for that. Personally, no, it still functions. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, so I do think there's a way that you could do Vineland with just just having at least probably a third of the book cut, if not more, like half or even two thirds. I definitely think that you could make a movie out of chapters ten, eleven, and twelve. Like if if oh, you just sure. if you just wanted to change it to a film about the rise and fall of this, you know, temporary people's Republic. I think you could absolutely do that. And it would be just as affecting emotionally without all of the, the like pre-built backstory in the chapters, you know, of, of one through nine. But you know, that, then that becomes a question of like, is that Vineland or is that something different? Yeah, it is. It, and I, I like the, the fact that Luke brought up cutting out the Zoid stuff at the beginning, because it, it is also mind blowing to me how distant all of that feels at this point in the book it really does <laughs> it's just that it's just not the, that far <laughs> like like oh yeah this book did start with a guy getting tricked into jumping through a sugar glass window and and now we're here having gone through an incredible emotional roller coaster of the the rise decline and destruction of of the people's republic of rock and roll it's so fascinating and the amazing yeah. thing for someone who's read vineland before if you're listening to this podcast is that that the stuff at the beginning is not abandoned right it, it's it's going to come back it, around yeah at, yeah. at, at the end here it, and it it doesn't when that happens it doesn't feel like it's it's stuffed in or unnecessary like the the fact that pinch as i'm sure we'll talk about as the weeks go on 
is able to build a resonance out of that is another just very impressive feat of his abilities as a novelist. Yeah. Well, when we, yeah, you because know, we started the book with Zoid, Hector, and Prairie as what appear to be the main characters. And Prairie is really the only one left at this point that's still, you know, regularly occurring. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it definitely does, everything does come full circle and there is reason for the, the, the opening and everything being there. And, um, but yeah, it's when you think about like, you know, we're more than halfway through this book now and, and how the focus on characters have sh has shifted so much. It's astonishing. Truly. Um, with all that sort of table setting sort of laid out, we can jump into the, the chapter sort of proper. Um, as Luke mentioned in, in his general thoughts, the chapter opens up on this Thanatoid party that both Weed Atman is at, as well as our good friend Van Meter, who's playing bass on a Jaco Pistorius uh, styled fretless <laughs> bass, which I, as someone who, who pretends to play the bass guitar, um, I appreciated the reference to. Uh, Jaco Pistorius, great, great jazz bassist. Uh, yep. Everyone should listen to his music if they haven't already. Um, he's essentially a god amongst bass players of the world. Yeah, absolutely. And then it sort of, you know, not, we, we can talk about anything from that very early section if we want, but it, the, the action, so to speak, of this chapter does not really kick into gear until the dentist is mentioned. Is there anything that we want to talk about prior to that character showing up, or are we good to kind of just continue on? I mean, it's, it's a good way to open the chapter, I think. There's some, there's some funny parts in there. There's some good... Like just good writing within there as well. I like just the idea of uh, Thanatoid like jokes as a concept <laughs> is funny to me. Um, I loved uh, Weed's uh, horrific jacket or suit whole thing that he's wearing, um, which is a grotesque like spandex Technicolor nightmare. What do you um, mean grotesque, Cody? That it, color palette. <laughs> It's not the color everywhere. Palette. It's the fact that it's it's a stretched tux, which to me is like he's wearing a wetsuit as a tuxedo. <laughs> like he just emerged from like some James Bond film where he had to like, you know, go from one boat to another. Um that's the more horrifying part of it. It's just this like skin tight uh faux tuxedo in a, in what is it? Uh hound's tooth, gold hound's tooth check. With a live, with live green athletic shoes, it, it's not even him either. Because as as the quote says, it says soon he began showing up at Thanatoid service organization affairs in ensembles of vivid chartreuse, teal, or fuchsia. The ties and cummerbunds hand painted with matching motifs like tropical fruit, naked women, or bass lures. Yeah. For tonight's annual get together, Thanatoid Roast eighty four, Weed sported a stretch tux in an oversized aqua and gold hound's tooth check with lime green athletic shoes. Ugh. I think the other important thing kind of is and you can kind of miss this if you're not paying super close attention, but this is taking place in eighty four. This is no longer the sixties. Yeah. And so you're kind of reminded that Weed is a Thanatoid. He something did happen to him that was horrific that led him to that condition. Um, but it's, it's easy to, to kind of forget that because the last time we saw him was at the barbecue joint, like, you know, probably 50 to 75 pages ago, if I remember correctly. Um, and up until now, his, his presence in the book has been as this sort of rising star within the, the, the people's Republic of rock and roll. So it's, it's, it's interesting to flash back forward and remember as a as a foreshadowing element of the tragedy that chapter 12 has inherent to it that like Pinchon is reminding the reader yeah this guy's kind of dead like mm -hmm. he he's not going to last in the state that he's in in chapter 10 and 11 this is going to go poorly and kind of throwing that out there um is an it is an interesting way to start the chapter yeah yeah and i did like there was a, a quite a few musical jokes and metaphors that I appreciated. Um, not just the, the Jaco Pistorius bass, but the, uh, the Thanatoid music being set in a minor key with a descending tempo is, I love that. And then the fact that a whole set can just be 32 bars 
is <laughs> absolutely wonderful. And I, I really got a good chuck out of that. But then also as a drummer, I did love the, the description of the drummer that Van is playing with, who, uh, in seemingly getting bored of, of playing at such a slow tempo, just has to have these moments of, you know, outrageous solos and, and screaming and, uh, it's it's accurate, but it's it's offensive at the same time. So, I do think. I mean, I think the drummer was on coke. Oh, um, most definitely. Yeah, that's why he kept heavily in the bathroom. Yeah, <laughs> which it is pretty funny to picture some dude all hopped up on coke, like doing drum solos and stuff, while like everyone just kind of stares at him. It, not yeah. just that, but like being hopped up on coke and being forced to play at an ever descending tempo. It's. Yeah, that has to be like some reverse, form of torture. It's a reverse uh, uh, Keith Moon, where he was always on like horse tranquilizers. Mm. Yeah, except no violence uh, against a drum yeah. kit broke out here. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> there are also just a lot of to to the note that you left in in the chapter notes here. There's just a lot of crazy names at this party. I love the names. Yeah. Carl Bopp might be one of the the most absurdly fake German German names <laughs> that I've ever heard in my life. I think Willis Chunko was my that was the one that got me. Man, Willis Chunko is a great one, especially for the name of a sheriff. Yeah, like I can picture exactly what that character looks like. Yep. with nothing other than the fact that that is what he does for a living, and his name is Willis Chunko. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then I did like the the all the uh, mention of of Holy Tail and Camp and the kind of ongoing conflict between them, which I, I think is kind of a good uh, you know shortened metaphor of um, U.S. and Vietnam. Yeah, um, and and the way that those two were handling each side of their own um, part of that conflict. And then I did I, there was a, a part I wanted to read out real quick before we get into everything with uh, Elasmo and all of that good stuff. The the kind of end game of of camp read like Ronald Reagan's wet dream. Oh my gosh, so true. Is yeah, so I'll just read the passage here starting on at the end of page uh, 221. Uh, sooner or later, Holy Tale was due for the full treatment from which it would emerge, like most of the old Emerald Triangle, pacified territory, reclaimed by the enemy for a timeless, defectively imagined future of zero-tolerance, drug-free Americans, all pulling their weight and locked, all locked into the official economy, inoffensive music, endless family specials on the tube, church all week long, and on special days, for extra good behavior, maybe a cookie. <laughs> Just, like... It, there's that, and then later on, uh, there's uh, Pinchon pretty well dismantles Reagan's entire administration in a sentence, and I absolutely love it. Like those are two of my favorite passages in this chapter. Is just his. I, it's not even subtle, like just attacks on on Reagan and all the horse shit that he was trying to peddle. Yeah, completely. I, I mean, I could not have described it better myself. Like that world is exactly what Reagan was hoping for um and is more or less still if yep. i can be mildly politically you know aware on our show um what the republican party is aiming for just yeah this this world of inoffensive culture of of no expression of, of different forms of culture no drug use and, you know yeah maybe 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 a cookie for good behavior um but only if you're religious and spend time you know making sure you're right with God. Yeah. A whole country of Ned Flanders. That's what, that's what we're going for. Absolutely. And, and to get to a musician that was mentioned earlier in this book, Frank Zappa, if yep. you want, if you want to experience really eloquent responses to that Reaganite era, I'd highly recommend listening to interviews that Frank Zappa gave during the uh, trials involving removing or censoring music that had quote unquote offensive lyrics in it. The Tipper um, Gore thing. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Which was the weirdest gathering of musicians to go against that between Zappa, yeah. Dee Snyder, and John Denver. The fact that the three <laughs> of them were in a room together is hilarious enough, but that they're all on the same page is just like the icing yeah. on the cake. I love that. And and those those hearings are really important to listen to, but there was a lot of just like 
late night news TV interviews that Zappa gave as well that you can find. Yeah. Where he very clearly articulates this idea of a emerging sort of Christian fascism monoculture that the whole censorship proposals and, you know, dare and all of that was very clearly tied into. And it's it's very interesting to hear him articulate that like 40 years be- before it became even more relevant now with with a lot of the emerging like christian right that occurred in the like mid to late 2000s i would say that that does bring us sort of to the arrival of uh dr larry elasmo dds i don't know what dentists did to pinch on because this is a case of a very evil dentist and also the whole Golden Fang yeah. dentist syndicate and in, in their advice. Yeah. I have to assume that something at some point happened between um, dentists and Pinchon to make him think that they were all involved in some sort of intergovernmental global conspiracy. Global conspiracy, including drugs. Like, <laughs> it's a very interesting synchronicity. Um, but I'm I'm just going to look for sort of the quote here, because this is actually one of these moments where after sort of the introduction of the character, the description of what happens to Weed as a result of that character is, this is not a horror book, but I was truly, like, horrified reading through this section, especially with just, like, the implications of it. So... This sort of starts at page 227, where it says, Weed could have ignored the form in the mail, but he was haunted by that first gleaming whammy on the freeway, so he showed up on time, wearing a jacket and tie, but had to wait, as it turned out, all day, in the bullpen just off the lobby, on a flimsy folding chair, nothing to read but propaganda leaflets and withered news magazines from months gone by, afraid even to go out and look for lunch. This was to happen again and again, Dr. Erlasmo always ran late, sometimes days late, but each time he insisted Weed fill out a postponement form, including reason, explained fully, as if it were Weed's fault. Weed felt more and more guilty as he became an old bullpen regular, one of a throng of what would plainly have been dental cases, but always proved to be something else, none of them smiling, who passed nervously both ways through the gates and the railing that stood like a bar in a courtroom, an altar rail in a church, between the public side and the office Penternalia full of their mysteries. Sometimes Dr. Elasmo would be rolling a table carrying a tray of shining. Why couldn't we'd ever make them out clearly? Was it the low wattage light in the place? Dental equipment of some kind? Welcome to Dr. Larry's world of discomfort, he would whisper, going through the paperwork. There was a recurring message, one too deep for weed, always about paper. I can't accept this form. This will all have to be renegotiated, rewritten. You'll figure it out. It was some long, ongoing transaction, carried out, carried on, like dentistry, in a currency of pain inflicted, pain withheld, pain drugged away. Pain became amnesia. How much and how often? Sometimes Ilsa, the hygienist, stood waiting by a door into a corridor, leading, he knew, to a bright high room with a tiny window at the top, impossibly far away, some blade of sky. She was holding something, something white, and he couldn't remember like that whole section starting with the description of how the government through official means forced him to start going to this dentist office and the fact that it's all this front for something so horrifying that it's not written out just the the implications of the fact that he's going into this place and not just dealing with like paperwork and government bureaucracy which is a horror all its own but that when he finally gets out of the waiting room and into these medical examination rooms, something is occurring to him that he has zero ability to recall, but that is damaging him, as we see spiritually over the course of this chapter, where he's becoming more and more paranoid, more and more worn down, more and more erratic. Like, that writing, and I know we've talked about Pinchon as like a Lovecraftian kind of horror in some cases, is so penetrating here as far as like a a nearly cosmic horror existing somewhere this idea that just 
he's seeing something or something is being done to him, but he has zero memory of it. He doesn't even know how to describe it. He can remember everything leading up to it, and it's all over afterwards, and it's wearing away at his sanity. Like, that, man, just sent chills up my spine. Yeah, it's... This is it's it's sections like this that reiterate what I've I've said several times since we've been covering this book now that I I really truly think if anybody were to adapt this it would have to be David Lynch because this kind of like unsettling abstract abject horror is something that really not many people or not many filmmakers are good at doing other than him that scene reads so much like the tension that's built throughout like a racer head or parts mm -hmm. of lost highway where there's there's really nothing it's not that nothing's happening like no one's talking there's nothing that's that's like jumping out and and trying you know it's just this like this terror that is sitting on everything and it's just there and it's brimming beneath the surface and the characters know it's there and it's built up in the atmosphere so much that it's it's palpable to the viewer as well. Like Eraserhead is still might be the most unsettling film I've ever seen. I it's incredible. Um but parts of that like the 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 hauntingness and the loneliness that exist in that that set the the tension for that horror to work is I, th I think would f would really fit into something like this particular scene. And, and that's where I'm like, okay, this would be, I think if Lynch did this, he could absolutely make that particular scene work as well as it works in the book. No, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right about that. Like, and I can't, I think part of the horror too is, is adjacent to, to both like, Lynch is also, of course, like Kafka, that idea of like this labyrinthian mm -hmm. horror that really doesn't make any sense, right? But is is capable of of running into anybody. And the early section where it's describing like the simple bureaucracy that led Weed to to have to go to the dentist's office reminds me of like the trial by Kafka. Yeah. Where yeah. where he's just told, like, yeah, you have to be here. And then as soon as he, he gets there, like things keep spiraling out and out of control. And to, to bring it a little bit back to Lynch, like imagine seeing that guy as a ghost of yourself who effectively set up the end of your life at just a party 20 years later. It's just the, like it's Robert Blake in Lost yeah, Highway. That was exactly what I was going to say. It would be like Robert Blake coming up to you and just this this force of evil penetrating effectively your psyche while you're standing there yeah but you have zero idea why it's evil you have zero comprehension of what's actually happening in that situation or to you it's it's incredible and again i say it every episode how did somebody say there's nothing redeeming about this book <laughs> <laughs> like i it's it's mind-blowing to me it that really that's is. the case yeah really um, is yeah, it's, so that's that is our transition point back to the '60s um, or the '70s, rather, where we hear about his experiences at the dentist, and then sort of what would happen is he would go back to the Republic, and then we kind of from there build into the the relationship between Furnessy and Weed. So before we kind of move further is there anything else that anyone wants to talk about before we go on i don't think i have anything other than i, I want to watch lost highway again it's, i actually rewatched it recently it, it's 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 grows on me every time i watch it i it was I the first lynch film i saw yeah i understand why people are confused about it uh, and kind of are, are thrown off by the fact that it, it shifts gears heavily halfway through um, yeah but as a statement on people changing into something else and, and identities shifting and changing based upon like morals and loss of morals, I think it's a great film. Yeah. I remember when he, in one of the few instances in which he kind of spoke about the inspiration for some of his work, he, he talked about how that whole film was, was essentially born from the OJ Simpson trial. Um, that hmm. really was like, Okay, and like he kind of explained it a little bit that the kind of 
duality of of someone like OJ Simpson where they have this, you know, public persona of, you know, the the good guy who you wouldn't think could be capable of such horror and then the one who is capable of that horror and how he created this sort of disconnect in himself to keep himself from remembering what he had done. Um, it's just a cool little thing to think about. And it kind of changed the way I watched that movie after I learned about that. Um, but to draw a line to that particular, that scene we were just talking about, like with both the scene that you read from the, from the book and the scene in lost highway where Robert Blake's character meets uh, Bill Pullman's character for the first time. If you describe that scene to someone, it sounds stupid. Like mm-hmm. a guy's at a party, another guy walks up and hands him a phone and tells him to call himself. Like, okay, fine. But when you watch that, like, especially if you're watching it in a dark ass room at night, holy shit, it's unsettling. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're looking for a, a content adjacent to Lost Highway, um, David Foster Wallace wrote an essay about David Lynch. Um, where he he did not want to interview David Lynch. He had zero interest in that, but he wanted to just watch David Lynch work and write an essay about it. And so he was the only journalist allowed access to the Lost Highway set. And the essay is just sort of his observations on watching David Lynch make a film, and it happens to be Lost Highway. I've known about that for a while. I need to read it. I started reading the oral history of dune of lynch's dune today um so I'm, it's looking to be pretty good oh you'll have to let me know how that is i saw that book and was curious about it yeah it's interesting so i'm, I'm they're right now talking about like pre-production stuff and all the the previously failed attempts like yodorowsky's which i still think would have been insane but yeah that's, i would have i would have watched it but i don't know how good of an yeah. adaptation of dune it would have been it, he, it, wouldn't, he, it wouldn't have been an adaptation it just would have been no. a my movie like yeah. vaguely vaguely based on it yeah he specifically shut frank herbert out of any kind of consultation so i don't think he was, ever read dune i don't think uh, Hodorowsky ever read dune i think that's, he, I think that's what he i think Hodorowsky claims he never read dune he did say yeah he i think he said he skimmed it he didn't read the whole thing i think kind of like what um uh, Alex Garland. Or Alex Garland did with Annihilation. Yeah, I knew what you were talking one. about. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, we digress. Yeah, um, as we often do. So the 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 frame shifts back to the to the PR three, and we learn the other phase of the FBI's plan to destroy a countercultural leader. First phase is the work they're doing at the dentist. The second phase is back in the PR three. They have Rex and and Frenessi specifically working to poison Rex against Weed Atman. This idea that you have this infiltrator in there who is who is slowly dropping hints about how Weed Atman has not been the Messiah that Rex hoped he would be. Speaking of Dune, and <laughs> that he is she is slowly radicalizing rex against him which of course leads to the confrontation that we eventually get to but i and that really gets to what i think the the ultimate point of this chapter and maybe if you want to call it a digression from the storyline with the pr3 is not just from a standpoint of explaining how fernesi and brock got together but it is a pretty incisive analysis of what happened to the black panthers of what happened to you know all of these different social movements that existed during the 60s and 70s like yep. i was particularly reminded of what happened with fred hampton over the course yeah. of this of this chapter which if you guys don't know fred hampton was the chairman of the illinois black panther party and the fbi basically got somebody on i want to say it was grand theft auto was what he was being arrested for i think so yeah and essentially said like look you can either go to jail for like 12 years or whatever the the sentence was or we can let you out but you have to work for us and infiltrate the black panthers and it started like small if you don't know the story of this guy and i know we've talked about him before i think i brought him up in one of the earlier episodes on this podcast but they started just small asking him to like give them reports on what they were working on, what like, you know, different schematics of like the buildings they occupied was. But as time went on, they eventually wanted him to give 
them access to Fred Hampton's apartment to know where he was. And then eventually, finally, they wanted him to poison Fred Hampton. This part isn't totally confirmed. It's based upon other reporting. But the, the story essentially is told that they wanted this guy to drug Fred, Fred Hampton so that he would be asleep when the police showed up. And then when the police and FBI showed up, they could, they could shoot him, basically, to assassinate this, this figure of the countercultural movement. And that is essentially what is happening with Frenessi, right? Frenessi shoots a video of Brock Vond, the two of them flirt. Slowly, Frenessi is, is, is giving him the footage they're actually recording of everything going on in the PR3. The two of them begin to become even more enmeshed. And then eventually it leads to where we are now, where a, where a plot is slowly coming together to take the whole thing out from the inside. This is all just based on real stuff that happened, guys. <laughs> like, that, yeah. that, is, that is what this entire thing is breaking down. <laughs> it's fucked up, too. Like, yeah. I mean, that definitely wasn't the only, <clears throat> um, the only instance of that kind of thing where the, you know, the, the government was putting plants within these organizations. But it's definitely the most notable and... and probably the most extreme absolutely um you had a note in here about rex's relationship with his car speaking of rex i put relationship in quotes for a reason <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's um i i i that was such a weird scene and it um i i know God, there was some like reality show on mtv or something like that years ago where some dude was in a relationship, quote unquote, with his car, and it was kind of the same thing. But I just, I know obviously that this came way before that, but it was, I, I have to wonder if this is just like, you know, pinch on showing materialism to a disgusting extreme that it ultimately kind of did get to and still is. Um, you know, we, we've become this kind of grotesque, um, you know, materialist consumer world where you know everything has to be marketed and and sold and packaged and and we you know i could go on and on about that but i just thought that was a really uh a really extreme example of <laughs> of that i'm not gonna i don't want to read that passage because it's you don't i do i do but i don't <laughs> let me find it let me find it here we go i didn't i, I didn't put think the page that, that section like you know as much this this whole book is obsessed with the 60s counterculture and it was a there was a, sub, a subsection of the 60s counterculture that was obsessed with cars. I mean, there's yeah. a fair amount of music devoted to cars from that era. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I do music. agree that it's, yeah, I mean, it, it was what it is, I think you're right. But um, I do think it is a, an example of materialism. I also think it's an example of just um, another kind of odd, odd, like, you know, another odd example of, of how the counterculture was kind of. Um, took things too far or became almost a parody of itself at, at certain points, you know? Um, yeah, no, that's definitely true. There was a lot of disingenuity in, in what they were doing. Um, a lot of saying one thing and, and doing the opposite for sure. Um, here's the scene. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, this is on page 230. I don't see you giving up anything, Rex answered. And this to both of them seemed a clear sign that their fates were diverging. Rex had once owned this Porsche 911 as red as a cherry in a cocktail, his favorite toy creature, his best disguise, his personal confidant, and more. In fact, all that a car could be for a man, and it's fair to say Rex had, a, had made a tidy emotional uh, as well as cash investment. Indeed, he would not have flinched from the word relationship. He called it Bruno. He knew the location of every all-night car wash in the four counties, had fallen asleep on its back beneath its ventral coolness, with a plastic tool case for a pillow and slept right through the night. And he had even more than once in scented petroleum dimness, had his throbbing manhood down inside one flared chrome carburetor barrel as the engine idled. And with sensitive care, he adjusted the pulsing vacuum to meet his own quickening rhythm as man and machine together rose to peaks of hitherto unimaginable ecstasy. I think it's also maybe a play on that, the whole hot tub, uh, jets thing, but that's like, I got, uncomfortable for like worried about like i just uh, it's uh i'm just imagining all the things that can go wrong in that situation <laughs> and then the fact like if something did like you gotta call for help now and and explain your way out of that and uh it's a lot 
it did remind me of the counselor by Cormac McCarthy, which obviously came a lot later. Um, yeah. And I don't, we haven't really, this hasn't been really a reason to compare McCarthy and Pynchon directly on this podcast yet. And we may never really get into it too much, but, you know, it does kind of show a, a similarity in terms of some, some of the um, obsessions that they have, especially with kind of um, transgressive and non-normative sexuality. Because uh, if, if you haven't seen The Counselor, I believe it's Uma Thurman has sex with a car, basically. I may not be Uma Thurman. I may be remembering that wrong, but it's some Hollywood blonde um, has sex with a car in that movie. And Cormac McCarthy wrote that movie. Is it Cameron Diaz? It's Yeah, I think you're right. I don't think it's Uma Thurman. I think you're right. It's Cameron Diaz. I'm almost, now that you say that, I'm pretty sure it's Cameron Diaz. She, her and Penelope Cruz are the two main actresses in that, so... And it's not Penelope Cruz. I do yeah. think it's Cameron Diaz. I think you're right. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've like as I mentioned during our bonus episode about McCarthy, I've I've spent some time in the Cormac McCarthy archives, and McCarthy screen he's written a, at least two screenplays. Um, and the first one he wrote does have some some kind of puns and a lot of puns and some some sections that are uh, in a lot of ways similar to. Pynchon's kind of more zany uh, comedy. Um, she don't necessarily associate Kermit McCarthy with Pynchon-esque comedy, but um, it's there at least in Sutri some, and then it's it's there in the screenplay Whales and Men. Um, yeah, and I do think that there's a fair amount of overlap between McCarthy and Pynchon kind of in general. Um, they just have, they just are obsessed with different uh, areas of the country and different time periods, but um, I do think that they there are there is some overlap between the two of them. Yeah, I would agree for sure. Is his archive also at the Harry Ransom Center in Austin? No, his archive is at Texas State in San Marcos, so like forty five minutes south. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, because their their archive like specializes in literature about the Southwest, and so hmm. a good amount of McCarthy stuff is about the Southwest. So they locked up his his archives. Are they, they're sense. the ones that kind of pursued him pretty pretty heavily, I think. There are, you know, as associated with, with the car and the inherent hilarity of that that exists in this section, there's also some interesting stuff in that... Well, A, I like that the, the sort of Black Panther analog is just called bad. Um, yeah. That that was a joke that made me laugh, especially their description and how it's 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 very similar to the Black Panthers, but just a bit more... I don't even know, like weirdly intense um where it says they all wore shiny black vietnam boots black on black camo fatigues velvet black berets with off black wide point stars on them chai com <laughs> style just to lounge around in who showed up by invitation at the clifftop republic and got into an all-day argument with its indigenous whom they kept referring to as children of the surfing class um yeah, just the fact that these people are showing up in in a complete head to toe black outfit including their own I guess regalia or medallia that they have is just also off black, whatever that is. So that that was a part that made me laugh. But there's some interesting stuff in there about kind of the the division between different countercultural movements in the time that should not have been at odds with one another, but that mm -hmm. actually were just for you know no reason, which is an issue. Speaking as, you know, these movements were largely associated with, with leftist politics, or at least left-leaning politics, that has persisted to now. There is still yep. so much stupid infighting amongst different groups that are supposed to be allies on, on the left side of politics. But um, it says at the end of that same uh, paragraph where it says... Rex grew impatient. He wanted to talk revolution, but the brothers from Bad seemed content to just play trash the Xanthrocoid with what, given his crowd, were some pretty easy shots. But we're just fighting the common enemy, Rex protested. They just as soon kill us as you. The Bad contingent liked that one and laughed merrily. The man's gun don't have no blonde option on it, just automatic, semi-automatic, and black, replied Bad Chief of Staff Elliot X. So, like, there's that aspect of just this sort of pointless infighting that exists but the other interesting thing as that kind of page goes on to to page 232 uh where rex kind of walks away from this meeting losing his car that he loved more than anything else but that he feels obligated to give them out of a sense of like 
we're in the struggle together man kind of situation yeah. that he's he then goes back to weed and and Frenessi and says i feel like shit and what business was it of hers he had no more illusions about infiltrators than he did about sunshine revolutionaries or for that matter the fate of pr3 but seeing how it was with weed and Frenessi, he knew there'd be no point in issuing warnings once he said you're up against true faith here, some heavy dudes, talking crusades, retribution, closed ideological minds, passing on the Christian capitalist faith intact, mentor to protege, generation to generation, living inside their power, convinced they're immune to all the history the rest of us have to suffer. They're bad, bad as they come, but that still doesn't make us good. Not 100%, Weed. What are you talking about? Weed standing all the way up. Rex was heading for the land of the May events and saw no reason not to say. Weed, bail out. Then what? Math. Discover a theorem. Weed frowned. Um, I don't think that's what you do with theorems. And I, I wanted to read that section out, not just because it shows the fact that, you know, A, the pointless infighting from the section before, but also B, just how quickly things just turn to a potentially lackadaisical mess where Weed doesn't even understand what his mentor is trying to tell him. And then in that message, Rex is trying to tell him, like, you need to be in tune with this. You need to understand what we're talking about and trying to communicate because the, the, the Christian capitalist, you know, fascists do, and they communicate to each other, mentor to protege for generations. And that's what he's trying to do with Weed, has been trying to do. That it's not working, and it's getting messed up by the FBI, of course. But Rex, as he says there, doesn't care about the fact that there might be infiltrators at this point. He's just burned out with the fact that this thing started. People were into it at first for the political idealism of it, and then it just seems like it slowly fell into just sort of a drug haze that wasn't really invested in actually accomplishing anything. Which is more or less exactly what happened with a lot of the hippie movements. <laughs> that yep. existed in real life so again just everything about this chapter does such a genius you know job of illustrating the issues that existed from did you get broken up because you were infiltrated yup did you get broken up because people lost interest and just started smoking dope yup this is just what happened and pinchon's just showing the reader but he's created these characters that you have some real investment in over the course of this book so it hurts so much more than it otherwise would. And that's, that's the effect of good character writing, that up until now, from a standpoint of his works being published chronologically, hasn't, had, not, had, you know, had not been as prevalent. Yeah, and that, the, I mean, it's shown in, that, in the paragraphs after what you just read, you know, the, the reality check that sets in on them as they're you know, talking about this and, and seeing it through and like, you know, what was all this for? Like what mm -hmm. we've done, we've put all this work into this and we've done all of this and that and the other. And here we are. And what, like, what was the point of all of it? Because we accomplished nothing. Everyone. And you know, as you mentioned earlier, Kate, like it's, this isn't something that's just relegated to this time in history. This is still happening. You have all these yep. groups fighting towards the same goal, the same end game. And they're getting in each other's way so much that they cannot accomplish anything because they have all these specific hyper focuses that they think supersede what the ultimate goal is. So they fixate on, you know, we need to do this before we can accomplish the, the main goal. And then you have, you know, all these schisms within these, these organizations that lead to their eventual downfall. And it, it's disgusting to see what the government did in, in how they set these plants in here like this and how they um, drove these groups apart from the inside out, but they were all, I mean, the, the seeds were already sown. They didn't really have to work that hard to make these things happen. It was already happening. They just had to go in there and kind of gently nudge uh, certain people in the right direction to get everything to fall apart. Um, and it's just, it's a really depressing examination of, of how we do that to ourselves and how easily we are, uh, kind of coerced out of our own interests at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Well, I do think that y'all are y'all are correct. Um, I do think that there's an aspect of 
Like they definitely, the the members of Bad definitely take advantage of Rex, and I I think they specifically take advantage of Rex being afraid of them and being afraid of losing face in in front of his white contemporaries. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds on this, but you know there there's a fair there's a there's a good a good amount of white liberals in this country. And I'm sure this has always been somewhat true. Who are like legitimately scared of minorities? Yeah, I, I by by legitimate I mean like they're very scared of minorities, uh, but they would never admit it. And um, I do think that Rex is probably an example of that, where he's he's scared of them. He's you know they he's scared of losing face and and seeming racist, so he goes the other way um, with that. And I mean you know, like they they're very against teaming up, and then the Porsche comes up. Um, and they start calling him revolutionary brother. They tell him to you know put the Porsche where your mouse at. Um, they're definitely, I think they're 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 taking advantage of Rex in a way that I think the Rex kind of deserves in a lot of ways because, um, you know I do think that they're you know I don't it's not clear why Bad shows up. I mean, um, the PR are... three was like looking for additional support to okay. help like push them their goals forward basically yeah i mean that that even that in and of itself is you know white people love to tokenize black people and you know i'm i'm sure that it would play it would have played well with the rest of the rest of the members of pr3 if they had some black panther analogs on their side and stuff um yeah i mean i i that just struck me whenever I was reading it as as being a possible example of kind of unintentional but still very much like white racism. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Also, I looked up what Uhuru means. Uhuru, it's um, a freedom in Swahili, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's what it means in Swahili. But it's also the name of a kind of post Black Panthers, more African centered um, freedom movement, which is I think pretty pretty leftist. If uh, Wikipedia is anything to go by. Um, so I think that they're pretty anti-capitalism and they link capitalism with colonialism and they view colonialism in Africa as being a, very much a negative thing where they were taken advantage of and are still being taken advantage of. Um, so I do think it's still active today, I want to say. Um, which is interesting. I mean, I don't, it's, it's, that's a very penchant thing to do to, to throw a, a reference to a real life revolutionary group uh, and use it for the name of a car. I also, this is a lot lighter, but I do love that he almost calls the car Bruno when he's talking about it. <laughs> like, you know, what, what mm -hmm. kind of car do you have? Oh, Bruno? Yeah, that was a great inclusion. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, th I think you're absolutely right, Luke. Like, neither side of that interaction is necessarily being genuine um as a as kind of a modern analog of what you're talking about there's a great key and peel sketch about like white liberals being overly um like apologetic <laughs> for for like slavery or racism to key and yes. peel as they're sitting at a bar um and there's a great punchline at the very end where the bartender walks up and he just goes, hey, if it makes you guys feel any better, black people make me feel really uncomfortable. And then they both just thank him for the honesty <laughs> as opposed to trying to disguise their own racism or tokenization of black people with these overly preachy, like, apologies. So, yeah, that is yeah. a very, a very real thing. <laughs> Most definitely is, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, that, that whole confrontation between rex and weed um as you wrote in the notes cody it is heartbreaking it is because it just it it feels like the dissolution of something that was supposed to have potential and especially like knowing i mean a it's heartbreaking because just before it weed basically reveals that he has forgotten all of his love for mathematics yeah whereas you know at the, at the beginning of his character when he's introduced would have you know literally couldn't like interact with people without thinking about math and now just doesn't even understand the process of how a math theorem is discovered yeah. and then you know you get that little bit of a backstory for rex that he's always wanted to to be a part of the the, the next generation of these these inspiring figures from from his own political awakening and that's just slipping through his fingers yeah well, and it's, you know, I, I think about those, the, the counterculture 
groups from that time. And it, it really is like when you really think about it on a human level, like it's, it is really heartbreaking. Like they, they genuinely believed in what they were doing. I think, you know, there's always going to be instances of, of people who are, they'll join a crusade for the, the clout or to, for, you know, to keep up appearances or whatever the case may be. I think honestly, a lot of them genuinely were trying to make a difference, believed in what they were doing and to devote that much of your life and that much of your passion and that much of your time to working towards this thing that you think is like you genuinely believe it's it's the right thing not just for you but for everybody and then to see it all fall apart and to cognizantly recognize that it's happening as it's happening is mm -hmm. such an like i it, it's it's existential horror really yeah for a little it, bit yeah. i mean it's I, it, I can't even i can't even fathom that kind of thing because i've grown up you know in the 90s and i basically realized from a young age that nothing i do matters so i don't i never really invested myself that much into doing anything um but i see that kind of resurgence coming now with the the sort of you know, the younger generation uh, who are back to this this kind of pushing for social change and really genuinely passionately believing in it and i want them to succeed because I, I, because we have seen what happens in these kind of situations, and so I think it makes a book like this and a scene like this a little more hit a little closer to home. Um, so I, we, I, there's a part of me that hopes history doesn't repeat itself here, but I know how cyclical that kind of thing is, and so it's it's a really depressing thing to think about. Yeah, well, and I think I think you're right in that Gen Z is kind of an impressive generation in how seriously they do take social and political issues and the degree of activism that they're already engaging in from, I don't, what is the age range of Gen Z? I can't remember, but from even the youngest elements of Gen Z, like the political activism that exists here. And I, mm -hmm. I guess we can kind of maybe get more to this towards the end of the discussion for this episode, but you can really only make so much entertainment about failed social movements and the way that the government destroys any challenge to its authority until eventually you'd hope that a generation of people recognize the playbook and sort of know what yeah. is going to happen to avoid jump, the same thing the happening again. Line, yeah, yeah, exactly. But I mean, the additional tragedy too inherent here from a dramatic irony perspective, which there's so much dramatic irony over the course of this book, and especially these three chapters, is that we learn like that a part of the poisoning here is that Rex and Fernessi have been spending a lot of time together, and that specifically Fernessi has told Rex that weed is an FBI plant, which we know is not true, mm -hmm. and we, we as the reader know is just coming from, coming as an outgrowth, rather, of the relationship between Fernessi and Brock. Which just, again, lends that additional air of tragedy to it, where it did not have to be this way. <laughs> like, yeah. there, this was a, a weird situation where this entire thing was incredibly organic. It came out of one person smoking weed on the quad. And even then, when there should not have been anything like this occurring... It still is happening because Fernessi's betrayed the entire movement to the FBI. And Rex has no clue and sort of doesn't care anymore. Like, is, is there an infiltrator? He doesn't care. He's just mad at weed because of the perceived betrayal there. It's an incredibly... Which, which also translated, it translates it into being an incredibly, you know, human reaction. Rex is basically saying, okay, I'll take my ball and go home. Like if you're not gonna if you're not gonna do yeah. what I want us to do, then whatever. You can die. This thing can fall apart. I'm done. Like it's it's there's so many layers of of real tragedy to this whole situation. Mm -hmm. Which which segues perfectly into you know the the section after this where we see the internal conflict in Vernessi and yeah. how she clearly understands what it is she's doing. She knows that the ramifications of everything that she's doing, but 
it doesn't it never stops her from doing it it's just mm-hmm. it's just always there in her mind and it's there's a it's it's a long section but i i i think it's one of the best sections in the in the book where this is kind of described uh it's on page 236 and 237 um Fernessi was on her own here improvising she knew she was messing with rex using him against weed wasn't sure if she wanted to knew that brock wanted her to that that had been clear since the day of the tornadoes but how was she going to sit down even lie down and talk any of it over with who who with anyway she'd have to tell it silently to a dl who would miraculously forgive her to the sasha whom years ago it had been possible to tell anything make believe interlocutors dolls in a dollhouse Fernessi had thought for a while that her need to talk would build out of control till she was helpless to hold it in and she ended up as a crazy woman on a bus bench along an endless flatland boulevard talking out out loud without rest like an astronomer seeking life out in space on a brave slender hope that somebody might begin to listen but in practice she'd only kept getting up one morning after another till at some point she'd found she'd adapted well enough to what she was becoming the house in Colito Canyon she was crashing at had a redwood desk with table and chairs where she could sit out in the early mornings, drink herb tea, and make believe her dangerous vice. That she was on her own, with no legal history, no politics, only an average California chick, invisible, poised at life's city limits for whom anything was still possible. Though she was lingering on the sunny side of 25 then, she still felt like some veteran blues singer with a lifetime of playing toilets owing money and surviving violence already behind her so that these early cool minutes on the deck when she could find them was with an unseen delirium of birds sun on the top of trees radio music wood smoke and babies squealing from across the canyon became what she held precious and often lived for it was the only piece she was seeing in her life with brock sending down these increasingly nutso directives plus calling up in the middle of the night to the dismay of housemates demanding yet another oklahoma rendezvous and with weed whose fucking each time they get met got wilder less in his control who with luck might make the guinness book someday but was meanwhile not picking up too many points for emotional maturity harassing her around the clock screaming at everybody else as he became more hysterical jinx now and now daily in his not to mention vernessi's face seemed to grow more grimly centered a close reader of cues others never saw she knew it was in her un- unturning stare whenever she and vernessi crossed paths that vernessi was close to her husband for motives other than sexual there were only a couple of things it could be Jinx shared her anxieties with DL, who'd been driving up to a dojo in Redondo Beach with her once or twice a week. Despite the difference in their ranks, they found themselves able to work out for hours together and think only fractions of hours had gone by. Most of their communicating was by way of their bodies. When they talked, it was strangely roundabout, reluctant. But they both saw, ghostly, denied, protected, another Fernessi, one they were prohibited access to. It hurt more for DL, of course. She might have expected it from a lover, but health had been partners. Like, that hits so hard there is mm-hmm. so much i it i yeah I just, it's a beautiful description of this inner turmoil that she's going through and that there's no way out from it at this point she's dug in so deep on both sides that it's just inescapable at this point yeah i was gonna i was gonna liken it to like her like it's like a runaway train in a lot of ways where she yeah, yeah. Yeah, she wants she doesn't want to be on the train, but it's it's going too fast. She can't she can't you know, she can't get off the train. She doesn't want to stay on the train, but it's just what's happening to her. Or she's, you know, in too deep is another way to put it. It's a runaway train and a trolley problem simultaneously. Yeah, true. <laughs> and she has been the other thing that's just so sad about it too is like she has ostensibly done all of this because she's in love, right? Like that is in theory, the reason why this has happened because she fell in love with Brock, mm-hmm. but she is so alone. Yeah, like the the fact that she has ended up marooned by the person by effectively love that she has is God. If that doesn't just strike right at the heart, <laughs> even though you know she's doing something wrong, she knows she's doing something wrong. You're effectively just waiting for this whole thing to blow up. But you also cannot help but feel sorry for her that this is the situation she's ended up in, even though she put herself into it. Yeah. I mean, again, it's passionately believing in something and thinking that it's the right thing to do and then watching it all blow up in your face and being yeah. unable to do anything about it. It's, it's heartbreaking. I'm glad that we read out that whole quote. That's pretty pivotal to this chapter. <laughs> yeah. And there's so much more to come to. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean that that whole scene itself represents them as as Pinchon writes hanging the snitch jacket on weed, mm-hmm. which is is really kind of not the final piece, but the final piece necessary to make what they eventually do okay and not and not lead to sort of a a revolt or potentially them getting killed in the process. Yeah. Um I wanted to ask you guys what you thought of the inclusion of the page break with the asterisk. Yeah. Okay. Cuz this this came up on the pinch on wiki too. It happens one other time on page 8 at the bottom mm-hmm. of page 8. The only thing I can think because that that particular part there is there's nothing there's no major shift in tone or anything on page 8. I think what it is is and I don't know the proper term for it, but it's like the the sort of episode within the chapter where there's a sort of double space between paragraphs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I but think it's just that's coming at the is. end of the page. I so think on, that's what it is. Yeah, I think I think you're correct in that. If the if it wasn't at the end of the page, it would just be a a, a single like sp- like empty line. But because it's um because it's at the top of the bottom of the page, it, there's a star uh, to signify that 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 there should be a line there, an empty line. Gotcha. Yeah, I saw I saw that and I was like, that's interesting. And then you're right, the Pynchon Wiki makes mention of it. So I was curious if you guys had any insight. So that that, that makes sense, Luke. Thank you. Um, did we have any thoughts on the scene between Weed and Furnessy where she glimpses what's coming for him in the near future? It's an interesting... I had to go to the pinch on Wiki to kind of get the the background information or sort of what pinch on was doing here because it didn't yeah. immediately strike me as obvious. It doesn't. It really doesn't. But I think once... It, for me, it was kind of the same thing. Like, it was continuing on... And then when, when what happens to weed happens to weed, that's when I went back and I was like, okay, now I kind of see, like, I kind of see it, but I had to go to the wiki as well to, to pick up on parts of it. Cause I still didn't really get all of it. I still don't know that I get all of it, but I, I see the foreshadowing that's there. <laughs> um, do you just want to explain what that is for the audience, Cody? Which part of uh, with like like what the pinch on wiki has to say and how that feeds oh, into the the foreshadowing yeah. part of it. Let me pull it up so I don't take their words and like paraphrase them. Hold on a second. While I'm looking for it, what it reminded me of to go back to an earlier point um, was the um, I, I, it's been a minute since I've watched it, but I think it's the opening of Mulholland Drive, not the dance jitterbug dance at the beginning, but with the older couple that she encounters and how, and then the couple of scenes later on and where she, Naomi Watts's character is, is sleeping and how that ties into essentially what the fate of her character actually was the whole time. Yeah, that's very true. This is, I, I stand by my comment episode one, that this is an incredibly Lynchian novel. <laughs> it really truly is. Uh, okay. So really what the main thing that the, um, that the wiki mentions is the famous Worms of Song line, uh, which is on page 238. The game turned out to be Pinochle, and she understood then uh, that years ago in Anaheim, she had seen the famous Worms of Song already playing a few pre- preliminary hands on Weed Atman's snout. Um, the pinch on wiki mentions that this is a play on the Worms Crawl in, the Worms Crawl out, the Worms play Pinochle on your snout, um, which is a childhood kind of song. Um, I remember hearing that as a kid a little bit here and there. Um, and so they just mentioned that that's a, this is kind of a heavy pinch on hit on Frenessi's knowledge of weeds impending doom is what they say. Um, but I think for like, for me reading this section and then going forward and, and having weeds, I mean, I don't know why we're dancing around it because we, we were talking about this chapter when <laughs> we dies. Um, you know, it's this, um, the uh, what is it one moment sitting by weed's nose curled at his nostrils enjoying the breeze in and out and the next all spooked streaming down the sides of his face nearly invisible now against the bedclothes yeah was that one of them she felt she rolled out onto the floor cursing under her breath put the lights on went and inspected every inch of the bed with the ball peen hammer she happened to have in her purse so this whole you know it's kind of foreshadowing how weed ends up dying i think in in a very vague kind of way but i think it's 
well done. Um, but it's one of those things, like, if this is, I think that if this is your first time reading it and you don't know what happens to weed, mm -hmm. it's a very effective way of foreshadowing it without really giving you enough to know for sure what's going to happen. Yeah, because to me, it just, it's, it's that idea that, you know, when you die, eventually you become worm food or worms will be all that's left of your, your, your body. Mm -hmm. And he, he's, he already has them using his body for something else. Like, it's, it's not completely clear, but it's, it's, yeah, it's just such an interesting way to do foreshadowing. That little section reminded me of Gravity's Rainbow a lot. Um, yeah, that's, that's a fair point, Luke. Yeah. Like, yeah, kind I mean, of the, the adenoid part or different parts of, of Gravity's Rainbow. There are a lot of, but that is a good point. Yeah, there, that, that could very easily have been in Gravity's Rainbow. Um, I also do enjoy the, the inclusion of the fact that Frenessi's made herself sunglasses out of uh, camera lenses, which is in, yeah. the, which is in the, next, the next section that we're about to go into. Um, but there's really, there's really nothing redeeming about this next section. It's just, it's just Brock becoming a character that I, I deeply, desperately want to strangle <sighs> with my bare hands. Yeah. yeah. I <laughs> hate him. So yeah, Brock sucks. I, I, I That's just... understatement. <laughs> this whole book could be called Brock Von Portrait of an Asshole. Yeah, I don't remember what episode of Mason Dixon it was, but I mentioned in the post show discussion that like I was reading through the Iliad and just had an an undying hatred of Hector through the entire time, which is not I don't normally have like a physical or like it, like yelling reaction to a character's appearance on the page or just like, you know, yelling <laughs> about them afterwards, but yeah, Brock has blown away my hatred of Hector to a degree that is that is orders of magnitude. This character, every time you think he's not going to get worse, he's going to get worse. Yeah, yeah, he is. He might be the best pinch on antagonist. It might be one of the best antagonists in really in any book I've read. Um, but there is nothing redeeming about the man at all. Mm -hmm. It's he is just a walking piece of shit and yeah oh god i hate him Such and, yeah and just like the the republic's already failing like that's the whole point of this conversation initially between frenessi and, and brock is just like everyone's getting paranoid the the kind of fix is in place for people to eventually turn on weed because she's been spreading the rumor that he's a snitch and yet brock is like nope it's not far enough yeah we, we oh, you, when i read that part i was like my fists were like clenching the book. Oh yeah, god. Absolutely. And just yeah, just the just the way that he slowly doesn't say it. He never says that Fernessi needs to kill him, but just hands her a gun and just the implication is there. Just we know what's gonna happen if this gun shows up. I'm not gonna say it. But you know what you need to do is effectively what he says to her. Yeah. And that whole that whole section um with with Brock and the gun and the kind of duality of of authority figures and guns and men with guns and camera and gun comparison, like it's one of my favorite parts of this whole chapter. Um before we jump into that though, I did want to just I, there's a line that I really liked um, where they, the um, kind of government infiltration of, of people and, and these, these groups and these, these uh, countercultures and everything is described as being fungal. And I absolutely love the way that it's written. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on page 239. Um, let me find it specifically here. Hold on just a sec. Oh, here we go. Um, Frenessi was finding out no matter how honorable their lives so far could be considered safely above it, wherever, quote, above was supposed to be, with money from the CIA, FBI, and others circulating everywhere, leaving the merciless spores of paranoia wherever it flowed, fungoid reminders of its passage. Just, like, that's such a great description of, of how deep and, and vast this whole thing is. Um, that was... 
fungus, I, not to get off on a tangent on how cool fungus is, but it really is <laughs> fascinating shit. Like there are, they've recently found that like there are, there are mycoidal con colonies in forests throughout the world that the root system is, is like square miles of interconnectivity. Mm -hmm. And it's like for that to be mentioned like that in, in 1990 is just so, um, so perfect in describing how deeply inset all of this is. So I just wanted to bring that up real quick. No, and you're right, because not only is it mentioned there, but if you go back to the beginning of, of the chapter, uh, Pinchon gives an example of that, where when it, it, he's talking about this kind of like slowly tightening noose of, um, oh God, what is it? Camp around Holy Tail. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where it, it without them doing anything, just things around them planting seeds for for holy tail where it says with surveillance farther up the watershed and over the ridge lines quickening so had the civic atmosphere down in vineland taken on an edge traffic downtown and in the lots at the malls grown snappish and loud with car horns and deliberate backfires boat owners anxiously in and out of parts places several times a day reports of naval movement at least one aircraft carrier sighted on a station just off patrick's point and AWACS planes in the air are around the clock now. Not to mention the continental charm of Commandant Bop all over the local news, as he, often in Nazi drag, <laughs> declared his volunteer sky force at maximum readiness. Something waited over a time horizon that not even future participants could describe. Once carefree dopers got up in the middle of the night, hearts racing and flushed their stashes down the toilet. Couples married for years forgot each other's names. Mental health clinics all over the country reported waiting lists. Seasonal speculation arose as to who might be secretly on the camp payroll this year, as if the monster program were by now one more affliction, like bad weather or a plant disease. The cooking in the cafes got worse, and police started flagging down everybody on the highway whose looks they didn't like, which resulted in a massive traffic snarl felt as far away as the 101 and I-5. As parrot smuggler... We don't really need to go into that hole. That was funny, but... Like, yeah. as far as, you know, just... It, he gives you an example, and then and then he follows it up here by by making that fungus comparison. It's another just beautiful piece of synchronicity within this chapter and the things that are being discussed and how it builds towards the inevitable conclusion that we're we know is coming. Yeah, and you had a note in here about the power of TV from page two forty, Cody. Yeah, so. I, I was really struck by one of the lines that um, that Brock said about um, having all of this, you know, all this interaction on film. Um, let me find it on here. At the very bottom of 239, it's all coming apart. Suddenly everybody's got a payoff story to tell. Total paranoia. Steering committee is supposed to be meeting down at Rex's tonight. We're going to be filming it. Once we have him on film, whether he lies or whether he confesses, he's done for. It doesn't matter. Just from being on film, almost affectionately. You'll see. No. And then he told her carefully, in detail, often crude enough to make her afraid, of Weed's visits to downtown D D San Diego for therapy sessions. Brock called them too much math, too many abstract ideas. So we gave him some reality, just enough to counteract that, no worse than going to the dentist, till after a while he could begin to see our side. So it's, you know, this this concept of of having things on film at this time was still kind of a new thing. Cause this is kind of when, um, home video equipment was starting to become ubiquitous and it incorporated this sort of level of power that hadn't been seen before for regular people to now have this means of documenting time and events as they happened. So you, you're kind of stripping away this, um, this, recollection idea of of you know like having to recall how something happened and and when and and you know all the little details of that now people can start filming on their own it, it's not relegated to just like you know expensive news stations or, or film studios people have this power now and it, i think it, that kind of ties into um the gun culture at the same time where you have now you know guns have been more ubiquitous prior to this but there came a time where that was something that was a tool of power that was not really 
able to be possessed by everyone. And then at a certain point in history, it became something that people could get and it shifted the power paradigm that existed. And then with cameras, now you have this irrefutable evidence machine that can show specifically what happened. So then now they have this, this situation on, on weed where this is his finality, like having him on film, no matter what he does at this point, someone's going to view that film and take it one way or the other. And it's not going to be good for him either way. And I think that's such a turning point in our society. We saw it in, in, um, in lot 49 a little bit with the, the assassination stuff. And then I know like in, in Don DeLillo's underworld, they had that uh, art installation where they were showing the Zapruder film on like, multiple TVs. Like that was the time where that was something that could not have happened until that point in history where the camera as a tool was now available to everyone. And now we have this like huge shift in, in how things are recorded and, and documented and, weed is unfortunately at the receiving end of, of how that kind of thing can be used. Yeah. And I think the other interesting thing to, to draw a point of historicity off of this exterior to the book is that it was the, the ubiquity of cameras that killed the Vietnam war. Mm -hmm. Like what was a government operation to, if you believe the official story to control the spread of communism was taken down largely by protesters who were just recording what was happening. That was yep. all that it took. And this book taking place and these scenes taking place either along the same time frame as the, the downfall of the Vietnam War or just afterwards, um, it goes to show that the government has already learned how to use that for their own means. They, they've had this tool used against them and they're already repurposing it for their own, their own sort of foul machinations in real time it, it's yeah it, it, you i couldn't have said it better better myself cody uh do you want to use this as a place to talk about 20 or 4 fps as a representation of media then yeah so have we have we talked about this before i couldn't remember if this is if this is something that anybody's brought up before. not that i can recall no okay so i don't know why it took this long for this idea to hit me um i i can't help but see 24 FPS as representing the media. Um, so specifically, the the line that kind of jarred me in, into seeing this was on page 244, when uh, Furnessy is is kind of pleading with with Weed to try and work this whole thing out. Um, Furnessy was crouched beside Weed. This will be your best chance, your most sympathetic forum. All you have to do is tell how it happened, how you think it could have happened. No one is judging you, Weed. The camera's only a machine, and so forth. Movie sincerity. Um, it's... It, 24 FPS, you know, to go back to what we were talking about earlier, like, this is an organization who started with, I think, a righteous concept and a, a good goal to work towards and then have over time become twisted, obviously, with Frenessi being compromised by Brock, mm -hmm. um, which is exactly, essentially, what happened to the media. You have this um, this force, this, this again, kind of the media, it is, in a sense, it's kind of a tool in, in and of itself um, that is being used to provide information and, and up to a certain point, we're doing it essentially with a balanced and, and sort of fair representation. However, and this is specifically referring to um, like film news, um, newspapers, I think at, at, you know, way back in the probably turn of the 1900s were already so corrupt and um, bought out by government forces that there was no turning back from it. But, but the TV media, I think for a, a pretty good chunk of time up until about Vietnam um, were, essentially just there as a neutral point to present information and to disseminate that information out and allow the consumer to do with it what they would. Mm -hmm. There wasn't really an attempt to slant it in either direction. It was just, here's what happened. That's it. And then after, you know, like you mentioned earlier, Kate, about after Vietnam and, and how essentially the, the U S government had its pants pulled down, um, they pivoted and took advantage of that 
and seized on it in such a way that they were able to to turn it to their the way they wanted to kind of manipulate it. And it wasn't really a quick turn. It I think took up until really around Nixon and Reagan, which is uh, you know perfect for why this is being brought up in here. Um, that was around the time that they were really able to sort of get a stranglehold of it, on it. And I'm not saying this is specifically one side of the political spectrum. Both sides are are doing this. And so it's no longer a tool that the the individual has or that we as a society have to ourselves. It's it is a skewed and slanted, distorted representation of what it used to be that is now being used for the the benefit of whoever is controlling that specific arm of it. Yeah. And I mean to to draw a more contemporary comparison for for maybe some of our younger listeners um it, i the, the easiest modern analog would be 911 where 911 yeah. was used as a springboard by a lot of news media networks to turn into 24 hour news media networks where then because we live in you know a capitalist society you have to justify the permanent sort of reporting of news and so from that is where we've gotten a lot of the opinion journalism, which didn't really used to exist in the same in the same way that it does now, where to to fill space, you just had, let's get this person's reaction, let's get this person's reaction. And then it, it just yeah. built into how can we keep people watching the TV? Because the longer we have viewers, the more money we make, the more we can justify, you know, the existence of a 24 hour news network and the money that we spend to to upkeep it. And it, it, it just gets twisted into something else entirely. I mean, it, that, that's really, I think, from a modern perspective, how we've ended up with, with the, the state of media that we have now, where it's just about, first it's just about how do we get people to watch, then it's about how do we keep people watching, and then from there it's a pretty easy descent into the talking heads yelling at each other that cropped up over the 2010s and has persisted to now. Yeah, and that's pretty much what happens with 24 FPS. They go from this organization that's supposed to be showing, you know, an unfiltered, neutral stance on, you know, here's what's happening, and then through Brock and, and other government forces become, at this point, where we are now with, with what they're doing with weed and, and, you know, trying to, you have these these two sides of it now that are trying to work towards their own end neither of which is where they were, had initially been going in the first place. Um, and their initial goal, all but forgotten, really. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the bodies that that leaves in its wake is terrifying. And in the case of Vineland, the body that it leaves in its wake is, is that of Weed Atman. Um, there are certain scenes in books or movies where... You know what it's leading towards. Like, you know what the end of this scene is going to be. And these are usually scenes that are not good. Like, something bad is about to happen or something traumatic is about to happen. But it, whether it's a, a novelist or a director, they have this way of prolonging the scene to build out that tension and that sense of impending doom as it slowly builds its way towards what's about to happen. And that's exactly what Pinchon does in this upcoming scene, mm -hmm. start, starting essentially when... Um, trying to find the exact... When it says, did Rex forget his bag? Like, the moment that dialogue came in, I think I audibly went, oh no. <laughs> Just yeah. I, I knew exactly <laughs> where this was headed. And the way that, that Pinchon uses the narrative frame here is genius the way that it keeps you know oscillating between the footage and then in sort of i'll say present day of the novel prairie and all of them watching the footage and the way that it keeps cutting back and forth pulling the reader in and out of that as it slowly moves down this pathway to the death of this revolutionary figure is 
if we had unlimited time for the show, I would say we should just read out the four pages that this takes up or, or, you know, however long it is, but it's just, it's so genius. Like it, it's just one of those moments where you just have to sit in awe of Pinchon's writing as he manages yeah. to balance two time periods, like five characters between the two time periods and just the way that in a very poetic sense, the film falls apart just as what they were filming does. That as this people's revolution that 24 FPS was documenting is destroyed, so too does their ability to watch it, so too does their ability to actually engage with the content as the camera gets knocked over and the light gets screwed up and it slowly turns basically to still images. It's so incredible. I, I it, it, Yeah. I don't think I have any other words that I can add there. It's just amazing. Yeah, no, it really is. It's, uh, yeah, you said it perfectly. Like, no, you know, you know the destination, but you don't know the journey. And it's, yeah. holy shit. Yeah. I, this is my, I think my third time reading this book and I'm, I still am never prepared for when that happens. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it, <sighs> pinch on, really is is very good at writing death scenes important death scenes um that i think are are highly um i don't want to say detailed but they're they're so integral to the plot that they require a certain amount of of detail and of of setup and this is this is absolutely one of those the other one that really stands out in my mind is is in against the day um, but this one, I just like it really, it's, it's really rough to read. Cause I really like, I really like weed. Like he's a great, mm -hmm. like he seems like a good guy. He's just stuck in such a shitty situation. And even though I know what's going to happen to him every time I read it, I'm always kind of hoping like maybe this time is different and maybe something happens and he like gets out of this. And then um, I get like almost up to that point at kind of like right after prayer or not prayer, right after Furnessy's talking to it. And I'm like, no, I know, I know what's going to happen and it sucks. Yeah. And for it to start with the court transcript is such an amazing choice by Pinchon. Yeah. Yeah. Just from a standpoint of, of construction of the chapter and the content here, it's yeah, it's, it's, I can't say enough about the scene. Um, but we'll forgo just repeating myself over and over again. <laughs> it's yeah, man, it's it's pretty incredible. Um, so yeah, weed 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 dies. Um, and so too does the Republic die with him. It it can't outlast the the man who was at its head, as is so often the case. Um, and we finally sort of reach the the internal narrative end of these last three chapters and i love the quote where we return to that nixon monument after this has happened and everything is in chaos where it says not everyone in 24 fps has shown up something was going on up on campus a rally or assembly and dl was there with the Ari and Zippy with a wind-up Bolex to see what would develop. There have been no posters or announcements or indeed any place left for communications to come from. Only the gathering and falling dark and confusion without limit around the fountain in the plaza where PR three years in their youth had frolicked stoned and nude, now at the black rearing silhouette of the Nixon monument against the sunset. Bullhorns with failing batteries quacking invisibly. Suddenly no one recognized anyone's face and each was isolated in a sea of strangers. A common feeling reported in interviews later was a clear break just ahead with everything they'd known. Some said to end, others transition, but they could all feel it approaching, something about how the smog was pressing from the sky, unmistakable as the waiting before some eclipse in earthquake weather. I just, I love that, that paragraph, because it, it captures people's reactions to something like that. Some say end, others say transition, that's such a perfect encapsulation of how people respond to things like this happening. But also that Nixon monument that 
in its previous mention was comical, now takes on this oppressively scary air yeah. of just this this man has been executed and he doesn't even know it, and the president presiding over the country at the time is just watching over them. It's such a, it's just such a oh man. I, it's I, I'm I, yeah. I I I can't say anything more about it. it it's amazing. Um, yeah. And and just the fact that like he refers to these PR threeers who in their youth, as if this has been around for a really long time. We don't get a good sense of how long it existed, but it can't have been that long to where children grew up to be adults. And you you get this other comment about how no one could recognize anymore. Just the way that he in one paragraph, you know, implicates the governmental structure that caused this and the man at the top of it shows the disillusionment where people literally can't recognize, you know, each other and, and don't know where they're going to go from here. It's just so amazing that he does it all in one paragraph. Yeah. And then it, and then it, and then it shifts into Brock's disgusting press conference, which mm -hmm. just, it, it just makes that scene hurt that much more. Um, and, and just adds another layer to Brock that I hate about him. Like this, mm -hmm. you set this whole thing up. You've you've completely destroyed these people's lives. You killed a guy, yeah. Like not you personally, but you pretty much did. Um, and now you're gonna go on TV and turn it into this fucking spectacle, you know? Yeah, which is again that to talk about the the manipulation of media for political ends. That's exactly what that is. Yep. Yeah, it's 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 chilling. Um and so too is this sort of I don't even really know how to describe the I'm even trying like having a hard time describing what it is, but like the the next couple pages where Pinchon kind of lays out this secret sort of highway leading to I guess an alternate Pentagon or yeah some sort of like detention center that's the, hidden the away fear. the yeah. federal let me find it federal emergency evacuation route right and how it's 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 an evacuation route sure so it's something that is you know on the books as probably being used for federal money to to support the people in times of crisis but is instead being used to shuttle off the the survivors of this event and that they're going to, as we learn, essentially just be kept there and, and more or less tortured by the government yeah. for information. Um, and this is one of those things that sounds absolutely real, and it was more shocking to find out that it's not. Yeah, do you want to go into that? Yeah, well, so, I mean, it, basically the, the whole thing, the federal emergency evacuation route, um, it's, it's set up exactly as you described, and while I was reading this, I was like, Jesus, like, I'm, I'm curious, like, where, where did he get this idea? What is this based on? It, he made it up. And that, but <laughs> it's, it sounds so plausible. And mm -hmm. honestly, I mean, it really truly could exist. And obviously no one would really know about it. Um, that's, I, I think, a, both a testament to his writing ability and to how fucked up the government can be that, immediately my my first thought is like well that's obviously a thing and he based it off of of some existing thing but no it's just something that he thought yeah they would probably do this and mm -hmm. it sounds fucked up and i i love the inclusion of like the detail of the route where it says virgil sparky plos 1923 to 1959 american martyr in the crusade against communism Lieutenant Colonel Plos was the first American of many who have attempted to clear from the face of our hemisphere that stubborn zit known as Fidel Castro. Undercover, posing as an ultra-zealous Cuban communist, Sparky soon charmed his way into the bearded dictator's office. His plan was to have offers to Castro and then lit for him a giant Cuban cigar that actually contained an ingenious bomb of Sparky's own design, made of plastic explosive detonator and a length of primer cord. Unfortunately, for freedom-loving people everywhere. An accumulation of manufacturing errors had caused the head and the, tr the tuck of the cigar to appear virtually identical, so that when the fuzz-faced Latin tyrant bit off the wrong end and pulled out the primer cord with his teeth, 
security guards were immediately alert to the danger. Overseers of a typical red slave state, they apprehended and executed Lieutenant Colonel Plos on the spot. The face above this was young, clean-shaven, and short-haired, and seemed to be smirking. As they discovered when they got moving, and one by one, new stone-colored medallions appeared throughout the rain, and their headlight beams, each of these folks' imagers had been given eyes designed to follow whoever was driving past, so the nomad's progress was observed, perhaps appraised, by silent miles of oversized faces, set a little higher than the average passenger vehicle stood. Had they been meant somehow for the long jammed and crawling hours of flight from the city, something inspirational to look at, to assure them all in a way not immediately clear, it is not the end, where there is still a hope? Was it only some travel game for the kids to keep them occupied, to pass the time till the sudden light from behind, the unbearable sight in the mirror? Like, it's just such a... That, that detail of, like, the government is creating this pathway and is decorating it with what may or may not be security cameras yeah um to watch the people traveling it as a constant reminder of like a martyr against communism when what we just read is basically a successful version of what that guy tried to do like it, yeah. it's it's such a chilling uh moment well and also i do want to just point out how absolutely well written the um the inscription on these polls is because it i mean it smacks of that 1950s 1960s propaganda mm -hmm. um bullshit that the, that the military would put out and it but it flows from the paragraph before into the paragraph after it's so perfectly well like it i mean it's just it's perfectly written i absolutely love that and it just adds so much ominence to that whole drive and how just ugh, creepy it's got to be yeah and especially that last sentence where it, it shifts from what's written on the medallions to the back to like them in the car watching them to finally that last sentence where it says was it only some travel game for the kids to keep them occupied to pass the time till the sudden light from behind the unbearable sight in the mirror that concept that what they're driving towards is unbearable yeah. like or or driving from is unbearable it's yeah it's just it, there's this podcast could just be us reading this chapter out loud <laughs> because of how much incredible stuff is jammed into just like 50 pages yeah um ah oh, it's so good yeah it's it's amazing um and yeah so from there we learn that in the fallout of the the P pr3 just sort of Falling into chaos because the government was like literally staged right at its borders for the moment that weed was going to be killed to them swooping in Brock's press conference to them claiming that that members of the commune killed each other instead of what actually happened. And there's a great paragraph in there that I won't read out for for sake of brevity about how the American public responds to that thinking that it's impossible that the government would kill its own citizens and then lie about it to. Mm. DL realizing that Furnessy is the only person who didn't get out. And she uses all of her ninja abilities to to go up to this this secret fear base and sneak in to rescue her. And it is, to Luke's point at the beginning of the episode, it is cool to see DL actually acting as a ninja in these yeah. sequences. Yeah. Um yeah. It's cool and it's also very this is this goes back to the the idea of this book being kind of formatted like a TV show. Um, yes, because I think this whole scene is just so. Uh, I I don't want to say wacky, but it's it's got a very like eighties stealth adventure. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I guess if if twenty four had been made in in the mid eighties. <laughs> uh, oh, my family used to watch that show religiously. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's just cliffhanger after cliffhanger and just, and it's, it, so I want to say this by prefacing, like, I, I'm not knocking anything that he does in this because I think the whole point of this is to show how ridiculous a lot of that kind of stuff was. But the, the sheer amount of just pure coincidence that happens throughout this whole scene from, you know, the, 
<laughs> wiggling her fingers to manipulate different people in different <laughs> ways. Um, and just, you know, she, she gets into a place and the right person is awake at the right time that she can talk to. They can give them the information that she needs to get to the next place to find mm -hmm. the next person. And then you have the kind of gratuitous sex scene that happens real briefly um, just to kind of titillate the viewers a little bit more. Like it's so well done. It's just so perfectly structured exactly like a show of that caliber would have been. Yeah. Um, and it's, so, yeah, go ahead, Cody. No, I, I, that was the end of my <laughs> thought. <laughs> so, so this brings, brings us to, I guess the, the potential um, crackpot conspiracy corner uh, that we still need music for um, yeah. in, in context of the message that I sent you earlier this week. And that, as you just sort of mentioned, there have been several moments over the course of reading this book that these aspects of it being formatted like a season of a TV show keep coming up from a standpoint of chapter nine. I believe it was, you said kind of represents almost like a mid season finale or, you know, maybe a season finale. And then the, the next half of the book is like season two to the fact that there appears to be a silent, mostly silent, I should say narrator who occasionally comes in and reacts to things on the page. Like the, the mm -hmm. scene with the gross food where suddenly this voice of God, I guess, is how I'll describe it, comes and goes, ugh. Right, it's Ron Howard in Arrested yeah, Development. Yeah, exactly. Hey, that's the name of the show. Um, <laughs> to, you know, these different moments where it's very clear that there is, not in the way that, you know, Cherry Coke is narrating Mason and Dixon, but that there is somebody removed from the narrative events commenting on it as the book goes along but only occasionally almost yeah. like you're sitting on the couch next to somebody and you're watching this tv show and occasionally one or both of you says a comment and there are other moments like what you were just talking about with dl's infiltration or the the sort of random sex scene or i guess masturbation scene is more accurate that's just there to kind of titillate the viewer or Isaiah 2-4's sitcom entrance at the beginning mm -hmm. of, of the book. Or even the cyberpunk gadgets that show up, which are, you know, easily framed into a, an idea of just sort of weird, like, man from uncle or Mission Impossible gadgets that these people have. That Pinchon seems to be in in my mind potentially working towards this idea of entertainment as a way of packaging tragedy or in the case of the countercultural movement government destruction back into a form of entertainment to be sold to the viewer and the reason why i mention this is specifically specifically because of what hector wants to make a movie out of at the beginning of the book mm -hmm. he wants to he wants to license the life rights to Fernessi and Prairie and their whole family to tell this story about Fernessi becoming a part of the government witness protection program and, and becoming kind of like a, a spy in his mind as entertainment for, you know, the, the, the mass general public. That's what he's wanting to do. And he's addicted to television. So maybe he can utilize something that actually happened to 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 show either the evils or the the possible good of what the government does for the world right so it's it's inherently thrown directly at the reader right in the beginning and it's almost like after that you're just watching the tv show that he wants to make or instead of a movie a series of movies that he wants to make you're being given that as the reader like this is what that would look like and the concept that the easiest way to slowly erode the public sense of uh, com maybe like not necessarily trust, but like belief that the government is evil or something is just to repackage it into entertainment. It's like what the Romans did with bread and circuses is a classic example. Or, you know, it, we can somehow, if, if we, we package this together in a, in a distraction for some people to make something seem fantastical, they'll look the other way from real things that are going on. It, it reminded me of an interesting, um, I, I think it was a Substack piece that I read. I can't credit the person who, who wrote this, unfortunately, but they basically said that it's interesting how in America in particular, like every, you know, 
15 years or so the government just says like oh yeah that thing you guys were talking about that we might have done we did that what are you going to do about it like was yeah. basically the, the point of this piece that i had written and it's very true in that like between stuff like operation northwoods the gulf of tonkin incident like there's so many different things that have occurred in this country over history that as time has gone on has either been used by the media to tell these kind of stories about the government potentially being evil or harming its own citizens and then eventually the government just goes yeah we we did that but it's everyone's so desensitized to it already through you know media movies being made about it books being written about it that nothing is actually done that these things can be used as a way to to lull the public into a a, a, a I guess malaise where they they don't want to rise up against the government or don't want to prosecute the people necessary for it. I mean, not to use like a too contemporary example, but like Epstein didn't kill himself. Like nobody believes that. But again, nothing nothing is is really done about it. Yeah, no, that's. I mean, you could even tie that back to to Gravity's Rainbow with the the line of you know if, if you can get them asking the wrong questions, we don't have to worry about the answers. Yeah. Um, just, yeah, it's distraction, you know, don't, don't worry about whatever we've done. Here's another, another thing to watch. Absolutely. And this gets to the, to the question of, you know, frenesy as a character, because, and we've talked about it, whether it was sort of Will last week talking about how he didn't understand why frenesy would go with this guy who so clearly represents everything that she's supposed to be against or, you know, sell out her friends or anything like that. And when I was thinking about that, as we were going through these, these chapters, this chapter, um, I, I kept coming back to the scene in chapter nine, I believe it is where Takeshi is approached by one of the other members of the ninjet retreat who tells that story about Lilith and Eve in the garden of Eden. And it's one of those things where you can easily forget about it being present because it does effectively resolve itself in that scene as far as why it's being included with that um, ninjet basically explaining to Takeshi that he needs to behave a certain way. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it deeper, especially after the context of chapters 10, 11, and 12, you end up with this understanding that the reason why DL sort of has to be, I guess I'll say, handled that way or, or interacted with that way is that if we look at that sort of story that he is told, DL is Lilith in the Garden of Eden, and then Frenessi is Eve, and Frenessi is the one who is seduced by the lure of this perceived authority of Adam, where Adam, in this case, represents the government and the perceived authority of the government to give her what she wants to give her you know power or love or whatever and that perceived authority of of adam or the government the fbi brock convinces her to give up her own control that she previously had whether it was with dl and their kind of kind of romantic partnership kind of not with 24 fps with the countercultural movement and so she as Eve betrays Eden, and if we're continuing to extrapolate out this this analogy, then Eden is the cultural, the countercultural movement. That that perceived authority, that perceived need for subservience, you know, wherever that may come from within Eve or Frenessi, leads to the death of this. And when you then go back to the Bible, the fall of Eve is what allows for the sin of man to come into the world from a biblical theology perspective and for ultimately what leads to all of the bad things in the world existing. And I think Pinchon, between this and Inherent Vice, and really a lot of his work, has been pushing the reader to understand that this was an opportunity <laughs> when these things were happening this was an opportunity for some realm of an Edenic landscape to exist. But because it was all betrayed, it, it fell apart. And the sins of the modern era, that being Reagan forward, were loosed upon the world as a result of it. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that's 
a really, really good analysis. Um, and it, I think in listening to you explain that again, after, um, you know, like you mentioned earlier, you'd sent that to me, um, earlier in the week, but I'm thinking about all of that right now. And then the scene after all of the, um, the infiltration, everything like that, the, the dream of the gentle flood, as it were, is, I, you could, I guess, kind of see that as an analogy of the, the biblical flood mm -hmm. and, and washing away, um, you know, because as it's mentioned in the book, it's, it's only the things in the landscape essentially that are, that are changed. The people, the, the living beings are, are saved and have the opportunity to get out of there. Um, so that, everything can just be kind of reshaped and, and have an opportunity for a, a reset essentially. Um, yeah. Which obviously we did nothing with when we had that, <laughs> but no, I think that I, I, your point is, is spot on. I think, you know, that that's exactly, I think what he was getting at is that, yeah, we had this opportunity. It was there. And we, I think that's probably arguably the closest we've ever come to a, an actual, um, revolution in in this in in the sense of what they were trying to get at, um, yeah. But the powers that be were proven to be more powerful, unfortunately, and um, that kind of landed us where we are. And so again, that circles back to the you know the hope with with Gen Z that they that I I think that their sincerity is is there, and you know. Maybe this is the this is the next opportunity, and and maybe this is the time that we get it right. I don't know. Yeah, and if if to not to like throw all of this on the shoulders of Gen Z, but it, it, it's also interesting how that dream that she has ends. Where is it? I guess I'll just read it. it it's relevant. Um, Frenessi told Dio later that the dream she'd wakened from was one she mentioned to her friend before, the one recurring. Things pages for her almost on a lunar basis that she named the dream of the gentle flood a california beach town the houses tightly crowded nearly all of glass huge windows that were really glass walls all trembling at the wind off the ocean would be partly engulfed by a tidal wave long announced daylit transparent green flowing smoothly in with plenty of time for people to get to higher ground bringing the sea in up the hillside exactly to the level of the house for nessie was in observing Though everyone in town was safe, the beaches were gone, and the lifeguard towers and volleyball nets and all the expensive beachfront houses and lots and the piers all covered by the cool green flood, which almost paralyzed her with its beauty, its clarity. For days, she could watch nothing else, while around her the town adjusted to its new shoreline, and life went on. Late at night, she went out on her deck and stood just above the surf, looking towards a horizon she couldn't see, as if into a wind that might really be her own passage. Destination unknown, and heard a voice singing across the flood, this wonderful song, the kind you heard stoned over at some stranger's place one night and never found again, telling of the divers who would come, not now, but soon, and descend into the flood and bring back up for us whatever has been taken, the voice promised, whatever has been lost. So even within that, Pinchon is, is telling the reader, it's not like over permanently <laughs> there, there's there's the potential for this to happen again one day yeah. and it you just need to be more aware more vigilant more understanding and if we're if we're likening gen z to the next sort of wave of potential for counterculture that would be that diver going down underneath the water to to retrieve what was lost i really love this book it's, it's so good <laughs> like it's oh, so good it frustrates me that so many people just don't i'm not saying it has to be everyone's favorite i just like it just doesn't get the love it deserves i think that's all it is yeah and anyway yeah no you're absolutely right you're absolutely right i i, I only hope that this podcast if it achieves anything gets people to understand that more than anything else. Seriously, yeah. I think if, if we can just get some the right kind of love for this book out there, I think we've done yeah. our job. And if there isn't um you know, if there isn't enough tragedy within this chapter, we learn that, you know, after the the dissolution of this republic, after 
Frenessy is taken to this horrible place um, where she's she's tortured, and I'll we'll spare the listener the description of what happens to her when she's there, and the the you know awful things that the government essentially does to her to repay her for her cooperation. Um, Prairie says that where DL left her is where she met her father, which. Like, God almighty, was that just something I didn't need to read after all of that? It's so... It's so heartbreaking. It yeah. Really. Like... It, you know, it's... I think this is... The... the, the let me gather my thoughts here for a second, because... <laughs> boy, this part just pummeled me. Um, I, th- I think you can, you can... You can make the argument that Frenessi is essentially like a a secondary antagonist in the story. A lot of her actions and things that she do, she does set in motion a lot of the terrible things that end up happening. Now, granted, she is essentially a proxy of Brock, who is really the puppet master in all of this, but she's not without fault. Um, but that being said, I think she is... There's such a redemption arc in there for her. Like there's there, she is capable of so much good. And you can tell, you know, we talked about earlier with her, the internal conflict that she was going, going through. And, and you know that she struggles when she makes these decisions that she makes. Granted, she makes the wrong ones. We still empathize with her. We still feel the, the pain that she's feeling and, and the conflict that she's trying to grapple with while she's doing all of this. And so it makes this scene that much harder to get through. If Brock was being tortured and treated like this, I'm in. I love it. More <laughs> of it, please. Mm-hmm. But the fact that this is happening to Frenessi and that, that we as a reader care about her, even though she's fucked up a lot and in big, big ways, I still care so much about her getting out of this that that scene is one of the hardest scenes to get through in this book. Yeah, especially especially that fight between the two of them and just that, the way God, that God, that killed me. Yeah, the the way that just it's the final dissolution of whatever existed between them and DL just DL just lets her out of her car at Las Segras and then she she meets Zoid and it, it is just a complete it shows you just the state of mind that she was in just yeah. she's lost everything and she betrayed everything for nothing because brock gave her nothing and for that just brief moment between prairie and dl where she says well according to my dad said prairie that's where they met was in Las Segras, the Corvairs had a two-week gig at Phil's Cottonwood Oasis, and it was love at first sight. And then DL goes, it usually was. Just, it's, yeah, it's it's that such a... so hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then you already know, because Pinchon did all this work at the beginning of the book, you already know what happened. You know that yep. they, they started hooking up and... You know, Furnessy got pregnant, and Zoid was all for it because he was still carrying the torch of the hippie movement. And and meanwhile, Furnessy's already seen what's coming and lived through it, and just wants to to try and live a normal life and maybe raise her daughter. And Zoid is just a constant reminder of what she betrayed and the evil that she did, like. I can't imagine trying to live like that. Like, of course yeah. you're gonna you're gonna run away. Like, like, yeah. yeah. Trying to trying to live with that constant reminder of of the worst thing you've done in your life. Every day when you wake up in the same bed as the guy, and yeah. every day when you you know eat breakfast and lunch and dinner and talk to him. Like, that's gotta be. That's a level of psychic pain that I don't even think Wallace could write in his book, and that was a guy who specialized in psychic pain. <laughs> Well, and what upset me more, I think, to to kind of lighten the mood a little bit here, is that right before this happens, we had good food. 
there was a scene with like <laughs> legitimately good food. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, this is cool. Like finally we get some you know, a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel here, but then it's all just taken away. Um but yeah, I just it's I mean, you put it perfectly. You know, it, it Pinchon set all of this up, you know, 260 pages ago. And, but did it so deftly that we weren't able, we, you know, as, as a first time reader, at least, you have no idea what is to come. You just see that, you know, Fernessi left this guy who, yeah, he's a little bit weird. He's a little quirky, but he's a good guy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she, she bailed on him. And so, you know, you, Without all the con, like, there's so much context that is is slowly being just kind of breadcrumbed along, and then finally, like, this is the you know, now we get it. Now we now we have to look back and see, like, okay, yeah, I I I get it. I get why she had to leave. Like, it wasn't that she wanted to necessarily; she had to. Mm-hmm. Like, you cannot expect someone to to have to live like that. And that's, yeah. and, and that's just another, like, that's just more on top of what she's already dealing with is that now she has to leave her child. Mm-hmm. <sighs> yep. It's yeah. Yeah. Heavy sigh. It's, this is such a, a really heavy handed, um, condemnation of, of the government and, and of authority and, and how the powers that be have, have had their hand in, in every, you know, in, in a person's life and, and the way that they shape that person's life without any care of how uh, it, it impacts them. I think I mentioned to you, you know, earlier in the week that I've, I felt Brock was such a good a- example of a solipsistic character mm-hmm. um, because yeah, I mean, he's literally in this for no one but himself. Yeah, like yeah. It, 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 Nothing matters other than how it benefits him, how it affects him. Just, and it's so representative of, you know, Brock is is the the kind of condensed version of of the Reagan administration, of the Nixon administration, the Bush administration, all of these late seventies, early eighties, uh, when you know the start of of neoconservatism really, mm-hmm. and and the that's essentially what it is. For, it's no longer about how do we help the people. It became how do we help us what right. helps us how can we use these people and these people and these people to benefit us yeah yeah completely and it's it just oh man i i mean I, I i don't i don't know if i have anything really that i can add to that it's 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 such a perfect explanation of i think the reason why why Pinchon wrote this book and wrote it when he did I think it's yeah. it's very clear that he lived through the Reagan years. Then it was like, okay, fuck all of that. I like I yeah. I need to somehow get this on the page to illustrate to people not the overarching concepts of so like Gravity's Rainbow deals in very abstract themes. The the people there are not what he's focused on. It's it's focused on the advancements of technology and the war machine and and how that does intertwine with humanity but it's 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 more in the abstract of what than, yeah what these yeah. concepts are but instead i feel like pinchon lived through the reagan years and then just went i need to somehow distill how this affects people on a micro level and just explain the true damage that is done by actions that the government undertakes like this yeah and if you've been sitting around waiting 17 years or however many years it was and you get this instead of Gravity's Rainbow Part 2, I could see how you'd have whiplash. Yeah, but it's still just, it's, it's all there. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. That's, I know we've hammered on this so much, but it's, it really <laughs> is, it's frustrating. Like all of the complaints that I have read about this book are completely baseless. Mm-hmm. Like I, I get there there are things about the book I could see that people with with valid reasons might not like. That's fine. But the majority of the arguments that I have seen against the book are I mean there's just nothing. Like there for Harold Bloom to say there's no redeeming lines. 
th- this chapter alone <laughs> has had so much just heartbreak and sorrow and beauty and everything condensed. It, it, mm, it just drives me up the wall. Like, if you like Gravity's Rainbow because it's, you know, this this angry, you know, look at what is being done. Like you just said, you know, like that's all here. You know, if you mm-hmm. like the the humor of of even, you know, at the time that this came out, like if if you liked the humor of V and the the kind of weirdness of it, that's all here. If you like the conspiratorial stuff in Gravity's Rainbow and Lot 49, that's all here. It's I, I I think it's just it's that whiplash that you mentioned, you know? It's just Yeah. I waited a long time for something to come out and it's it's not the thing that I specifically wanted. And Oh God, this is, <laughs> I can get, I can get, I can get real off topic real quick here, but, um, I was having a conversation with my wife earlier about, um, Chuck Klosterman. Okay. And, uh, how just awful he can be like, yeah, I, I, there's things about his writing that I appreciate. And then there's times where he's just really cringy and anno- annoying and, uh, and gross, and it reminded me of he did an interview with Liz Fair back in like 2003 when her self titled album came out. And for listeners unfamiliar, Liz Fair is amazing, go listen to her stuff. <laughs> um, but she came to prominence in the early 90s. She did an album called Exile in Guyville, mm-hmm. essentially, it was formatted as a track by track response to the Rolling Stones' Exile and Guy Exile on Main Street. Um, it's a very loose concept, but the ideas are there, but she basically earned a lot of praise for it. It was a very ambitious album. It was, um, for at the time for a a female artist to come out and be as, um, open and and frank and explicit as she was, was kind of unheard of, but a lot of, a lot of male listeners and male critics kind of glommed onto the sexuality of it and never really let go of it. Flash forward to 2003. And she puts out this self-titled album that's a lot more polished, a lot more um, poppy at times. Um, it's still, it's not a bad album by any means. It's not her best work, and I think she's admitted that since then, but um, it basically it didn't get the reception that I think it deserved, specifically because it wasn't Exile and Guyville again. Mm-hmm. And Klosterman brings this up, and when he's talking to her and um, she basically t- tells him, he mentions that it's, it's the, the analogy she makes of, of um, why she made that record because she had grown as a, as a person. She had a kid. She wasn't the same person that she used to be. He, he says, basically, that's a perfect analogy, but I find the sentiment depressing. She says, really, that bums me out. I know exactly what you're saying and I understand entirely, but to hear you say it's depressing makes me kind of sad. I don't know why you should be depressed. Do you feel like you've lost someone who could make you feel that way? And he says, no, it's not. That's not it. It just seems like you've made this decision to, and she cuts him off and says, you keep saying this was my decision. It wasn't a decision. These songs just aren't there anymore. I'll let you go through my demos and look for them if you want. I think this record is depressing to you because it makes you feel that you've lost part of your own childhood. And you realize you can't get that back. But I can't make a 25-year-old's record at the age of 36. For me, it boils down to this question. Do I want to seem authentic or do I want to feel authentic? And I chose feel. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the same thing with Pinchon. Like, he's not that writer he was in 1973 when Gravity's Rainbow came out. And to expect him to have been is unfair to him as a writer and really kind of immature as as a reader like you have to allow for an artist in any capacity in any media uh, medium to to grow as an individual as an artist and it's okay to not like what they put out you know as as they get older and make different art that's fine but to not like it because it's not what they did in the past is such a bullshit move yeah absolutely it it's really frustrating when when people do that because I, I and I think a lot of it comes from um yeah they they made something maybe that that was you know formative in your in your growth as a person and whatever the case may be that's fine but art is all about growing and it's all mm-hmm. about 
changing yourself as a person and and adapting to the way that that the world is changing around you and and how your life changes. He had a kid, you know. Yeah. And this is I think a a, a writer and a human being going from a justifiably angry 20 something, you know, at the time of of Lot 49 and and Gravity's Rainbow and seeing the world change around him and seeing the people in his life change around him and seeing the movements and the zeitgeist of the world change around him and ultimately retaining a lot of what shaped him and what made him the person he was when he wrote those earlier works. But now he's a more mature person with a different lens, a different way of viewing this, this whole situation, a more mature way of viewing all of this. And he's seeing the humanity that exists in everything that's happening, not just seeing the machinations of everything, but now we're getting down to this granular, like this is exactly like you said, this, how is this affecting these people? Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a fundamental difference between those two time periods. And I think it's what really has made his work since gravity's rainbow all the better is that he is now writing these, these characters and adding this depth to these works that elevate them beyond what gravity's rainbow was and that's nothing against i love gravity's rainbow but i'll take his later stuff over that most of the time yeah no i i I completely agree i I think you should leave all that in the edit because i think that's such an important building of context especially you know when we talk about does it feel authentic like the characters in in vineland feel authentic the characters in mason and dixon feel authentic Uh, i can't speak for um against the day because i haven't read it but the the characters in in inherent vice feel like they're going through authentic circumstances if you want an updated gravity's rainbow that's bleeding edge that's that's what that book is for the the 21st century um so he he wrote that too and people didn't really like bleeding edge when it came out you're you're gonna (laughs) rise like like if if you want the same implications that Gravity's Rainbow is talking about on a, on a macro level updated for the 21st century, that is what Bleeding Edge is. And it, it's I like Bleeding Edge because it is a mixture of that with the effect on people in a more condensed, less esoteric volume. But it, it's it, you're I, you're absolutely right. It, it is all about you know what does this have to do with with the individual people that it affects and that's of course what he's thinking about as he gets older and has more life experiences and sees all that change i i couldn't have said it better myself well i think the the last thing i'll i'll mention and as far as our coverage of the the chapters themselves is i i want to go back and and read the one sentence takedown of the reagan administration Go um, for it. That that almost ends the chapter. Yeah. Um, but oh, holy shit, is it a mic drop? Uh then again, it's the whole Reagan program, isn't it? Dismantle the New Deal, reverse the effects of World War II, restore fascism at home and around the world, flee into the past. Can't you feel it? All the dangerous, childish stupidity. I don't like the way it came out. I want it to be my way. If the president can act like that, why not Brock? Yep. Complete mic truck moment. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that pretty much covers this whole chapter. Um, I don't know what else we could really add at this point to chapter 12. I mean, if we started adding, we would be here <laughs> for another couple of hours at least. Abs- yeah, absolutely. Um, we need to make a shirt that just says absolutely on it. We really do. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I realized... All of us used to say that, but I have really carried the absolutely torch <laughs> since then. <laughs> yeah, you're you're putting in the work, and we appreciate um, it. <laughs> so that does that does bring us into to funny parts. Um, other than the the Sid Barrett thing that I'm glad we both clocked, um, which there's there's a, a portion on page two thirty three, which I'll just read here let me circle back she's aware of her importance here shaded safe saved a person for them both to pretend to explain things to as a way of negotiating old agreeable version of history yes old rex here he nearly blew me away rex afraid so kid kept saying you get it yet huh you get it i said get what he said oh well, maybe you should get it now huh 
You think that's a good time for you to get it? I could see he was carrying something in his bag. One of those rough-out shoulder bags with all the fringe the guys carried for a while. Something concentrated, heavy, but you couldn't tell for certain. Could have been a part for his car. Um, and, of, of course, the Rex kind of disappears from the narrative after that. Um, for those who don't know about Pink Floyd, Pink Floyd, <laughs> Pink Floyd started as a band led by a man named Sid Barrett who, uh, according to the accounts of his fellow band members and other people in the kind of emerging psychedelic scene in London, just was kind of constantly on acid. Like, Did never... all of the acid. Yeah, just, like, was never not on it, other than maybe when he was sleeping. And it, it sort of induced either a latent... Um, some people have, have, have guessed, like, schizophrenia, or led to an... In, inducement of psychosis and the last time that anybody in pink floyd saw him until they recorded wish you were here and he showed up randomly and they didn't recognize him was this recording session shortly after they released their their debut record piper at the gates of dawn where he was playing a riff on his guitar and he was trying to teach it to david gilmore because David Gilmore was going to take over for him in the band when they were playing live. Sid was initially still going to write the lyrics and the music, but because of where his mental condition was at, he wasn't going to tour with them anymore. So he was trying to teach this guitar riff to David Gilmore, but every single time David Gilmore would play it, Sid would change some part of the guitar riff, and then he'd, he'd ask him, you got it yet? And then David Gilmore would play it he'd change it he'd say you got it yet and apparently this went on for like 20 iterations before <laughs> eventually he just finally said you get it yet and then got up and left and just disappeared um and that as a, a news story sort of like you've linked here in the notes came from an article that was written in 1978 so long before vineland but it it does mirror what happens with Rex incredibly well. We're just he's just been eroded like his spirit has just been eroded by the the downfall of his ideal sort of utopia into drug use and abuse and infiltration and he does this back and forth before finally just disappearing from the narrative entirely. Um yeah, it's it's like most things in this chapter, it is both funny and sad. Yeah. But yeah. um I, I'm, I'm glad I wasn't the only one who read that and went, is that a reference to Sid Barrett? <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I, I uh, like we were talking about before we started recording, I'm not the biggest Sid Barrett era Pink Floyd fan, but yeah. I know this, the stories about him and, and it really is sad. Like the, the last time they saw him when they were recording Wish You Were Here, which is ironic that he showed up during that album's recording session. Right. Um, so just an album about him and he manages yeah. to show up. But just so like unrecognizable and just out of it that he really couldn't even interact with any of them. It's just, it's rough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I am a very big fan of the Sid Barrett era Floyd it's my favorite stuff underneath the name Pink Floyd, but I also acknowledge that it's not really Pink Floyd, that it's, it's kind of something else, and the band uh, became what it's known for really after he left. They are um, kind of two separate bands almost, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Do you have any other funny parts you want to go over? I did really like the uh, Ayo Ver all over pun on 258 when uh, I think it's DL and Furnessi are, are talking and they're uh, at the, yeah, 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 when they're at the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And the the waiter comes out. It's a Spanish restaurant. And he says, Ayo ver, which in Spanish means to rain. Um, but it's also almost look, I mean, it meant to look like all over. Um, heartbreakingly funny, but a good pun. Yeah, definitely. Um, that takes us to quotes. Do you have a specific one you want to read? We've read a lot I of quotes have, like, this episode. Five. <laughs> so many. Yeah. Um, and you know, Will's not here to, to for me to steal any of them from. Such a shame. It really is. Um, you know, I think I'm going to go with the very last paragraph of the book. Um, or of most, the book. Of it, at least, 
of the book. Jesus, my brain of the <laughs> chapter. Um, so the bad ninja mobile swept along on the great Ventura among Olympic vis- Olympic visitors from everywhere who teamed all over the freeway system in midday densities till far right, far into the night shined up screaming black motorcades that could have carried any of several office seekers cruisers heading for treed and more gently roaring boulevards huge double and triple trailer rigs that love to find Volkswagens laboring upgrades and go sashaying around them gracefully and at Nat's ass tolerances plus flirters deserters wimps and pimps speeding like bullets grinning like chimps above the heads of TV watchers lovers under the overpasses movies at malls letting out bright gas station oases and pure fluorescent spill canopied beneath the palm trees soon wrapped down the corridors of the surface streets in nocturnal smog the adobe air the smell of distant fireworks the spilled the broken world i think after everything that we've gone through in this chapter that's just a a beautiful ending um just a little bit of everything in there i like the little rhyming in there of um wimps and pimps speeding like bullets grinning like chimps very musical Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a yeah it's just a nice way to close out a, a really heavy heavy chapter yeah I agree honestly I had a hard time picking a quote like I normally don't have this problem of of all three of the books we're, we've gone through now but when I finished chapter 12 I, I literally just went I don't think I have one <laughs> I was like there, there's too many there really are that's just from the standpoint of like trying to isolate a section to specifically like highlight or talk about it just felt like an impossible task um but what i i eventually sort of settled on is is from 260 the conversation between dl and and frenesi in the sort of diner where they're actually finally eating good food where she says i'm not some pure creature frenesi wanted to cry the film queen, some no-emotion piece of machinery. Everything for the shot. Come on, DL, please. You know what happens when my pussy's running the show. You saw me do stuff he'll never see. And DL, not as angry by then, might have answered, I made you do stuff, bitch. And Frenessi would have felt a body-long twinge of clear desire for her already ex-partner. A preview of delicious trouble for DL's body whose rangy sweetness she loved now was just as likely to try and hurt even cripple her and who knew what she and who knew but what she deserved it worse would be knowing she'd pushed DL into losing it that fine clean self-command they'd all taken for granted DL the steady beating heart of the collective who could never have made the deal with Brock that Frenessi had and feeling at the same time mean satisfaction in provoking her out of that saint-like control yep one more rap she'd have to take, but at last it was mercy she'd have to plead for, reduced to be playing helpless, blaming external drug molecules for each of her failures, complicities, and surrenders, as indeed national governments were even then learning to do, with an already devastating impact on any humans who happened to be in their way. That one I picked, not just for the poignancy of the last quote of, you know, the fact that the government was learning to utilize drugs to sort of addle the masses which is obviously a foreshadowing of what reagan does in the second term with crack cocaine Mm -hmm. um but also just the the final resolution to whether or not frenessi and dl were actually romantically involved with one another which finally comes through in that quote that the you kind of have this sense that maybe dl was in love with her but it was just she never picked up on the hints that she was dropping as i talked about chapters and chapters ago the kind of sapphic yearning that exists within dl but it's never really confirmed whether or not that was the case but here it is where there is a tacit acknowledgement that the two of them did not just sleep together but that they were partners and that was how they saw one another for at least a time and just sort of the that description of how they feel about each other now after all this has happened it's it's again another really intense emotional moment that is at the same time just very real like sometimes there are relationships that you're in where 
either one of them seems like they could potentially move past all of this if there was just an acknowledgement of how they truly felt or uh, just a little bit further of a reconciliation between the two of them. But it's just the, the moment is past and it's, it's something that you can't truly come back from, even though both of them clearly kind of want to. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just another excellently written piece of this excellently written chapter. Totally agree. Yeah. And the other thing that, that just occurs to me that it, we really didn't get into in this chapter because it, again, involves circling back to stuff from, from previously in the book is the implication, especially from a, from a governmental overarching perspective, like we were talking about with this book being a bit different from Gravity's Rainbow, of what being a thanatoid means. Like, yeah. we, we watch Weed become a thanatoid by the end of this chapter. We see how he ended up there. And if we look at the thanatoids, as you kind of talked about in Chapter 9, as this kind of allegory for a lot of people coming home from Vietnam, like, that's also been done to them by the government. That is also a, a broad indictment to the brutality of the political machine that has been allowed to exist and similar to you know sort of what we were talking about about these things being packaged into entertainment and movies to be sold back to the the public or entertainment to addle the masses what do the thanatoids do they watch television yep it's yeah this is incredible truly incredible we have some questions comments um things mentioned uh i do want to start by apologizing to somebody who emailed us a, a few weeks ago i think before our break asking for some information on a podcast that we talked about back when we recorded lot 49 um i made a mental note to visit your email and i'm sorry that i forgot about this they reached out to us on instagram to ask the same question and their question was essentially whether or not we remembered the podcast with a British professor who'd read Lot 49 like a like hundred times or, or whatever. Um, normally, we, we type up a document with like all of our comments and, and everything in it that we go through. And we didn't have that document last week when I would have responded to your comment or your email. That uh, British professor is actually an American professor. The podcast is British. Um, there's a a British podcast called Backlisted that goes through like historically significant books. And it's being, it's a podcast that I believe is run by a small press publisher. If I remember correctly, where one or two of the hosts is the same every single week, but then they invite on guests who are particularly knowledgeable about an author or the specific book that they're talking about. And the only pinch on they've covered is, is Lot 49. Um, and they invited an American professor on to talk about Lot 49. And she had read Lot 49 like in innumerable amount of times because she teaches it for her college class every single year. Um, I don't remember her name, unfortunately, but if you look up the podcast Backlisted, that is where that specific reference was pulled from. And she has a lot of interesting insight that she kind of drops over the course of the the podcast i will say i wish that they let her talk more because she, like right at the very end when they're kind of wrapping up because the show's not long it's not like a long form discussion like we what we do here it's just sort of is like about an hour she starts dropping all this crazy information that they didn't get to but that she clearly wanted them to get to and then the show just kind of ends so it's like oh just let her talk for like another like half hour i want to know <laughs> what all of that was that she just started talking about um so that is that is the specific uh reference that, that you were looking for more information on the podcast called backlisted again and it's just the, the the crying of lot 49 episode do you want to read the um comment here from youtube that's the same person oh is it the same person okay. yeah they reached out to us on youtube instagram and uh email so thank you for utilizing all of our uh yes contacts and sorry it took so long to get back to you but yeah um 
did we have any other mail to go through or anything? Because we we mentioned the Twitter shout outs last week from from Waste and Tom Pinchon's ghost. Okay, that's right. Um, no, I don't think we had anything else. Um, okay. All right. Oh, we didn't do our most pinch on part. That's so true. What was your most pinch on part oh, of the chapter? You sh- left this blank. Yes. I know because I couldn't <laughs> think of one. Um, you know, I'm gonna go with um, I'm gonna go with the DL's infiltration scene and its its TV tropiness. I mm-hmm. loved that, and I thought that was very much uh, a pinch on esque kind of thing to do. Yeah, definitely. I would say. The twisting of of real historical fact to tell the the story of the downfall of this republic um, mm-hmm. in a fictionalized context would stand out to me as a particularly Pinchonian aspect of this chapter. Might be the obvious one, but um, something more specific doesn't stand out to me at this time. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a suggestion from from a listener of uh, putting in the show notes some of the miscellanea that we talk about that we feel kind of ties in other media that ties into the, the either the book in, as a whole or the specific part of the, the book that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's actually a pretty good idea. So I might, I might do that and we'll, we can kind of, you know, over the week decide what we want to put in there. I would say at least for right now, just to have it in the recording, at least mm-hmm. uh, go listen to Jaco Pistorius Easily one of the greatest bass players of all time. Definitely one of the Tracy. jazz bass players of all time. The dude yeah. is incredible. Um, so check out his stuff. Go watch some David Lynch. If you haven't seen any David Lynch, I would say start with Twin Peaks. Um, or if you like, if you like horror, like abstract, weird, unsettling horror, like the, the scene that Kate read earlier that we talked about, go watch Lost Highway or Eraserhead. Yeah. Um, both excellent films, both deeply unsettling. Um, and I would... <laughs> Eraserhead has one of the best film scores ever. Yeah, true. And Lost Highway has one of the best soundtracks ever. <laughs> so uh, another thing Lynch and, and Pinchon have in common is they're both very good at, at inserting popular music into their work very true yeah i would totally second jaco pistorius uh the album portrait of tracy is a masterpiece i don't remember what band he played in he played in a band for a really oh, long yeah, time he did um yeah and i i wish i could remember that off the top of my head right now but yeah look up the band that he was in listen to that watch some frank zappa videos from his oh, interviews yeah. in in the 80s and 90s i'll put links for that in the show notes for sure um i would also say like to get i i've already mentioned this movie through the course of recording the our episodes on violin but watch judas and the black messiah um that's a that's a dramatization of the killing of fred hampton by the fbi uh, and it's actually very well done and very well acted and and scripted and then yeah i would second the the lost highway recommendation or or twin peaks um also just listen to angelo Badalamenti's score Jesus, for, yeah. for twin peaks um it's good it's background so good. music for vineland <laughs> yeah it really is I suppose I that, that yeah i suppose that'll that'll bring us to the end of our discussion of chapter 12 of of vineland um hopefully everyone will be healthy next week so we'll have all four of us together um I said it at the end of the show this time instead of the beginning, so maybe that'll change our fortune. Yeah. Um, but yeah, until until next episode, thank you for listening, everybody. Bye. I think what I'm going to start doing going forward is what I've started doing with Vineland is I'm reading the book while also listening to the audiobook. And it was hard for me to do it first because I have a faster reading rate than the narrator does Mm -hmm. but what i found is that forcing myself to slow down and read at the same rate that the narrator is 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 narrating out actually gives me more space to absorb the content yeah so i think i'm gonna just start doing that going forward i've heard people say the same thing with with listening to the audiobook at the same time i can't i don't have this 
particular one available through the library for audio. So I've just been making more of a conscious effort to slow down because mm-hmm. um, I tend to read quickly, especially if it's, you know, something that I'm reading for the first time. I'm just kind of letting it all wash over me. Um, but I'm, I'm making sure like with, with all of these books that we're doing, I'm like really slowing myself down and, and taking my time on it. Yeah. What luckily. Found, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say what I have found is that I, I, every, every time I sit down to read this, I have my little twin peaks reading music playlist and it fits <laughs> so well. Like it really, it really like it just solidifies that Lynchian feel to me. I did recreate your your playlist on Spotify, so I've been using it as well. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a good soundtrack. There's certain times where like the right song hits at the right time, and I'm like, hell yeah, this is perfect. It reminds me of this this podcast that I listened to you saying that called um, "Till Death to Us Blart." And oh every- yeah, where they watch rewatch. Paul Blart every year. Yeah, and like yeah. I think this the second year Griffin watched Paul Blart while listening to Dark Side of the Moon by Pink I Floyd. Think he he mentioned so I haven't listened to that one. I I am a regular listener to my brother, my brother and me. Same. And I think they brought that up on there at least once. Yeah, if you if you listen to I think there's like a super cut, if I remember correctly, of Griffin's comments on it, but he brings up the weird synchronicity between that album and Paul Blart in a way that's that yeah really entertaining. Like the the one, the first thing that um that at least I remember him bringing up is that when the stupid security convention scene with all the different gadgets is happening, money starts playing if you if you've synced it up properly. Oh my god! <laughs> and like Griffin. By the end of the episode, was like fully convinced that maybe the editor was having a laugh <laughs> because there's way too many moments that oh, perfectly funny. sync up. It's 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 apparently exactly the amount of time it takes to listen to twice if if you're yes. watching Paul Blart. Okay, I'm gonna have to listen to that now. Yeah, I've, like I know they've mentioned on my brother, my brother, me. And I, that's one of the few podcasts that I like try and keep up with. Yeah, I mean, I've uh, looked out with the audiobook thing because they just added audiobooks to Spotify Premium. Um, oh, okay. So just they're all included in a Spotify Premium membership, so you're just able to listen to them. Yeah, I wish... I Like, Libby is pretty good about having books through our library, but the, the pinch-on that's available is... Uh, they only recently... So it used to be they only had Gravity's Rainbow. They only recently got Mason and Dixon in Lot 49. Mm. So... Yeah, I, I, one of the things that if I ever do become, like, rich beyond my wildest imaginations is that I will pay Joanna Newsom however much money it takes for her to do a reading of Inherent Vice in, Ooh, the, in the Sword of Liege voice. Because that, of all of the amazing casting choices for that movie, she just nails that narration style, which is largely just chunks of the book taken and translated into yeah. dialogue in a way that I just I would love to hear the whole thing read with her sort of performance as that character so weird to me that she's married to Andy Samberg I can't yeah I just can't wrap my head around that her music is super interesting if you've ever listened what to what I've it. heard of it I yeah I've, I haven't heard a lot of it but what I've heard has been pretty interesting <laughs> 